one year since humanity lost their war against the demon kin, a vast majority of human had been massacred, and the surviving population had been captured, destroying their mental capacity and using them as hosts to give birth to new monster. He was the last human where the world has met its end. As the last survivor of the resistance, he has continued out that lonely fight. Up until this moment, in the face of the demon lord Tartarus, the monarch of demons, Zephyr gets stabbed by the monarch's sword as he sat down waiting for his end. Tartarus casts time slowing magic to Zephyr as he wants to continue carries out the conversation a little bit longer. Tartarus commends Zephyr as he is the first human who has been able to bother the monarch in such a long time. The tenacity he possesses is astonishing, that he applauds Zephyr for that. Tartarus tells Zephyr that those who give up after being scared of their opponent's power are not wise, they are just weak. When he sees those who are weak and are without perseverance, he get angered beyond belief. Tartarus offers Zephyr to works under him, as someone how had climbed to the top of the human world. He claims that he will take him to go beyond that small world to another, to even the home of gods. He adds that he wants to conquer all the other worlds with his power and Zephyr's. With the impact of the fight they just had, Zephyr's body has been shattered beyond imagination. He can tell himself that his body has no way of healing back to its original form. Thinking about the offers, he assumes that it's actually not. Zephyr thoughts that Tartarus only wants another way for him to beg for his life. He then approached Tartarus's hand, the thoughts of the loved one comes to his mind. She knows that Zephyr's personality is so awful, she has always told him this and that. And since he never listened to her, she placed a peculiar spell on him. So if Zephyr ever do that with his hand, his body would explode with the power that would reach beyond their realm. And that's is his answer to the demon lord, while also giving Tartarus his middle finger. He explodes himself, where the explosion went as far as the whole plateau. Unfortunately, the demon lord is survives, only his hands get incinerated. The only thing he can think of is anger, he is so angry towards the human that time by time always annoy him. What's left of Zephyr now is his burned body, which the demon lord punches to subdue his anger. And with that, Zephyr's fights had finally ended. He wasn't able to get revenge for his cherished one and couldn't save humanity like they had wished. It ended in vain, just like that. But what he doesn't know is, he awakes in his recovered body with his memories intact and even his armor is fine. He wonders where he is, thoughts he never see a temple with the statues of God like this. The conclusion he has is, it's the afterlife in the underworld. But there's someone coming, she says that it's not the underworld, but the lowest floor of the pantheon, where the gods reside. The sounds comes from an angel, and Zephyr fails when he tries to summon his sword. The angel tells him not to worry, introduces herself as the high-level angel Mercedes who will share the words of gods. She tells him that he already died. She explained that usually he would have been sent to the underworld directly. However, by the strong demand from the three great gods, they have decided to send Zephyr back to the past. She explained it further that Zephyr will retain his memories, but not his ability, train physique, magic power, and obtain skills. The only thing Zephyr can think of is it is a dream, and Tartarus cast an hallucination ability on him. He thoughts further that when people were dying all around him during the demon's attack, and when he was desperate praying for help, the gods had ceased all communication with their world. They refused to answer their prayer, and they didn't receive their sacrifices either. Also, they took away the clergy's ability to borrow the power of gods, causing them to lose their abilities to heal, resulting in the quick demise of the human armies. Once they calculated that there was nothing to gain, they threw away their world. There would be no reason why those calculating gods would give him a chance like that for free. The angel actually knows what Zephyr is thinking, and what the gods want is something a little more interesting to watch. Zephyr is mad, then shoot a mana punch, threatening the angel, doesn't even want to listen to the angel's explanation. He is so mad, to the gods, when Zephyr and everyone he loved fought with their lives was just for entertainment for the gods. As he going angrier, the angel summons the gods' power. A massive leg appears, stamping on Zephyr. The angel then explain, by providing his own self-worth, that is the only way that he can receive what he pleases. That is the same for humans and other species alike, as nothing can be free in this world. She explained further that there is one god that has been strongly demanding for his return for another reason. It turns out that Tartarus took his anger towards the angels. He wants another fight as he doesn't accept the fact that he got hit by a mere human. Then the angel asks again, does Zephyr would take the offer? And it's obvious now, as he says it, if Tartarus really wishes to die, Zephyr will grant that wish. So the angel starts the spell, as Zephyr thoughts that even though it's an opportunity given by the disgusting gods, an opportunity is an opportunity. 
and he will take that opportunity to take his revenge on the demon god Tartarus, and to all the gods who look down on him like bugs. The next thing he knows, he wake up being called Rookie. There's a man pours water on top on his head. Zephyr thoughts that he feel like he has been seen them before. Looking at the stigma, he remember when he was a slave of the temple, ten years before his fights with the demon god. The first thing he does is to look for a place that no one's around, then open the perks for being returned to the past. He gets headache as the information comes into his head all at once, either it's top class skills and items, and even abilities that were implemented as actual skills. Zephyr is happy and thoughts how crazy it is for them to give out something like that. Then the supervisor of the slaves find him out. He repeatedly tells him to get back to work and comes closer, going to whip him. But in this second life, Zephyr able to catch it. Instead of agitating the situation, he simply just apologize then get back to work. Zephyr is wondering why he is able to catch the whip. He assumes that it looks so slow because of all his battle experience until the battle with the demon god. Thanks to the skill called Wall of Iron, that even there's no scratch on his hand. That skill is the first perk he gets, drastically increases defense power, and makes him completely ignores damage that is lower than his defense power. Lastly, the passive skill will cause him to not tire out easily and could do the mining work all day long. As Zephyr submit his ore that day and they announce the rankings for each team, Zephyr's group received the first ranking and according to their protocols, the supplies for the last place will be divided among the ranks above them. It is then explained that the Temple of Area, one of the three great gods, is the biggest religion and also the biggest loan company in the continent. Most of the people there have either lost their homes to monsters, or were once adventurers, but were rescued by the temple and became slaves to pay off their vast medical bills. Anyhow, while Zephyr still has the stigma on him, he is not free to move around as he pleases. If he goes outside the work territory without permission, his heart would stop and he would die immediately. So, he need to quickly pay for his medical bills and regain freedom. Only then he can proceed with his next plan. While also thinking about his past lover, Altair promises that he will protect her this time. Zephyr then comes to the stall, asking to get recovery potion and he dump all of his money to buy the recovery potions, even goes as far as taking a loan to pay for it. He explains that the recovery potion, that recovers a small portion of one's health, has a hidden effect where one's magic power increases if one drinks a large quantity. And the other perks that Zephyr has called the Vision of Hermes which drastically increases the effect of all potions by 500%. Day by day, he repeats the same process on mining to earn money, drink the recovery potion and trains. One day, he reports to the mining supervisor that he heard a monster's cry, so he asks the supervisor to call the hunter team then he can lead them towards the place where he heard the monster cry. It is then explained that the monsters are beings that were born from warps within magic. Since most monsters were hostile against humans, they had caused so much damage. However, they also gave humans a second chance. The crystallization of magic within their bodies, the magic stones, the bone and fur used as material for items. And before they know it, monsters had become a precious material that they couldn't live without. That also meant that dungeons were to be home for monster, while also dangerous they were also like treasure chests waiting to be discovered. While hunters, sometimes are slaves that were selected and chosen for their combat prowess and specialization in hunting. To compensate for the facing the dangers that were monsters, they had a higher base pay, and were paid with incentive based on their progress. Zephyr gets back to the stall to buy recovery potion, but the stall owner refused to give him more loan because of his rank is too low and maxed out his loan limit. Then a priestess offers him money if he would sell his organs, and of course for the sake of getting stronger he accepts the offer, and the stall owner gives him a whole pack of the recovery potions. Zephyr chugs it down as the priestess thoughts that he is crazy for drank at all. As he finishes drinking it, the hunter team arrive calling out to him. The leader is go then he introduces the team, and Zephyr says that even though he don't have night vision, he is able to use mana detection which enable him to spread mana in a wide field and heighten his sense. He explained that in order to go deep into a dark dungeon without attracting attention from the monsters, it's crucial that one has that kind of skill. As they prepare to go to the mine, Zephyr also being tasked to be the porter. It is revealed that Zephyr gets transported to the hunter team after a month the dungeon in the mine was cleared. As he remembers it, he knows at least one of the team members, and if things were to go the same way, two of them would die in the dungeon. Now, Zephyr plans to use them for his own advantage. At the entrance of the dungeon, there are another team waiting as they are the scout hunter. The leader gives the hunting team each a bracelet. He explains that the string bracelet laced with magic. 
and if something were happens to the hunting team while they are in the dungeon, the other bracelet that he wears will snap by itself. If that happens, he will request backup from the base. While the hunter team enter the dungeon, he also reminds Zephyr that he is with the reconnaissance team and as long as Zephyr pays attention, there won't be any need for that. Inside the dungeon, wolves monster waiting for them. The hunters use stone to distract them and when they are, they close in and get behind them to finish them off. Their main role was to check if there were monsters and gathering information about the inside of the dungeon. Based on the information they collect, they would then create an attack squad that would have the necessary firepower to clear the dungeon. That's how things usually went. As the reconnaissance team was also made up of hunters with combat abilities, if they determined that it would be easy to handle, there are times when they clear the dungeon themselves right away. While the other members are not sure, Gold manages to convince them to do it. Even after saying that they have dead weight that they have to carry, Calling out to Zephyr, Goad then tells him to take out the supply he prepared earlier. It was hazelnut leaves and seeds, intended to be used as bait because it gives out the smell of female kobold. Since the smell is so strong, they kobolds in the cave would notice it right away, and when they ran ecstatically looking for mating the hunters will lay traps to kill them. Zephyr remembers how in his past life he works together with Goth. As Goth wants to receive approval from others, he never had the chance to do so. But in this life, Zephyr tells Goth something before deciding to clear it. It was to clear the dungeon with traps as Zephyr claims that he went inside the dungeon alone, telling Goth that the dungeon is only invested with small kobolds. So Zephyr suggests to clear the dungeon themselves as Zephyr thoughts that it would be a waste to give up the chance to other people. And with that, the slay the kobolds inside, while Gother fells proud of himself to be able to take all the credits clearing the dungeon. Going deeper into it, one of the member, Gale finds something that leads to some kind of a nest, where suddenly, there's a massive claw reaching out to him. As he has no time to react, the claw manages to grab him and throws him out surprising the others. Marco immediately readying himself for battle and telling the other members to stand behind him, as he fells afraid with the thought of what might hide in the nest. What he doesn't know is, the monster is quite big and he doesn't have a chance tanking it. Meanwhile, at the same time outside the dungeon, the scout who gives them the bracelet is surprised to see three of the bracelets is breaking all at once. That's when Goth tries to stand his ground, with blood running down from his shoulder, while Zephyr helps him defends against the tail of the monster with his will of iron passive skill. As the tail grab its prey, what comes out is Predator, a monster who uses its pheromones to trick others monsters into thinking they are the same species and eats the monster that raised the Predator when it's become fully grown with the sole purpose to wreak havoc. Zephyr is all fire up now, taking the spear Goth uses and readily take on the Predator. With his third perk from the gods, in his left hand is the silver key to a room in a forgotten castle, where he can store and withdrawn items from. In other words, a subspace artifact. He uses it to take out Dragon's Soul Plant which will make him calm upon consuming and a cloth to tie up the spear to his hand so he won't lose it. Goth tries to stand up, thinking that there is no way a miner could stand up against the predator. But then it screams, uses its skill inflicting fear deep down into Goth's heart. Goth then remembers the stories his seniors had told him when he was new. A few years ago, when an adult predator attacked a nearby village, it said that the villagers couldn't even blink and had to witness the event because they were paralyzed by fear and couldn't even move a muscle. There was nothing they could do except wait for their turns. But what he witnessed now is so far from that story. With a spear in hand, Zephyr trades blow with the predator. Because of the dragon soul plan he prepared, he didn't get affected by the fear effect. As he doesn't have enough magic power to slay predator with sheer strength, he takes out a green substance, thinking that's more than enough to take care of puppy like the predator. He reveals that it is the Venom King Fade 70 second Venom and coating his spear with it, which Zephyr gets from his good friend, where he spent all of his life researching poisons. He says that it's better if everyone uses it, as he hopes that if his poison can kill one more piece of trash to save one more person. With the spear coated in poison, Zephyr stabs the predator making it screams in pain. It turns out that the lethal venom burial, which was made with the most common herbs will enters one's bloodstream and spoils their organ, while also caused excruciating pain. That's also why the venom king called a big sadist. As Predator tries to stamp Zephyr, he estimates that the venom will fill its body in three minutes and until then he needs to stay alive. But he forget the fact that Predator can use its tail. As it swing it, Zephyr fails to defend against it and gets thrown against the cave's wall. Swiftly, Predators came right in front of him with an open jaw, intending to shred him to pieces. But Zephyr has another plan for it. He throws another vial of the venom to its mouth before evading the upcoming attack. 
as it is not enough for him, Zephyr also land multiple hit at once on it, making it screaming even more and vomit blood. Looking at it, he has about a minute left until the poison spread and coming again to the predator, decides to lay the finishing blow himself, its tail swinging again, attacking Zephyr but now, he evades it and grabs onto it, propels him right on top on predator. He let go of the tail and with the spear in hand, he stabs the predator in its head making it cries out pain and it even tries to swing its claws to Zephyr, but it only manages to break the pole of the spear instead of hitting him. Zephyr then takes the broken pole and stab it again on its head. As it was not enough to finish the predator, Zephyr takes out a knife from his hip stabbing the predator on its head again. At this point, the predator just rampaging around the cave in pain, trying to get Zephyr off from its head. The only thing Zephyr needs to do now is to take the final blow on it. So he uses the momentum from the swing, jumping in the air on top of the predator. Armed with all of the recovery potion he drank all of this time, he uses a simple technique to envelop his hand in magic power. With a skill called Discharge he punches the spear, piercing through the predator's head. Goth who witness it all, can't believe what just happened, thinking that with strength like that, Zephyr could easily move to the hunter team. He misunderstood that even Zephyr didn't win over his good side. Zephyr Worth would have quickly been recognized anyway. But right now, Zephyr is nothing but a miner, and Zephyr needs a ticket in form of Goth. Somewhere else, there's a group of people ganging up on a last living person from a kind of group of people. He cries that he is not the demon god worshipper. But Sahach, a man with a robe calls out to his teammates to crush him anyway. From that crushed person's corpse, there's a centipede coming out, marking him to be the demon god worshipper, which Sahach immediately destroy the centipede. The next thing he does is reporting the matter to his leader, called Matthias, as he is mad that in order to find one demon god worshipper Sahach needs to slaughter seven members of the temple. It turns out that they have a plan to do a raid in a month, and Sahach promises Matthias that he will rule out the heretics from the temple as much as possible and deliver a better result in the raid. Arriving at the Department of Human Resource, Goth nominates Zephyr to be a hunter in his team. The priest then process the nominee. It turns out that in the cave, Zephyr asks Goth to talk. He wants Goth to not reporting the appearance of the predator. While Goth is worried the might be found out, Zephyr takes the predator's corpse into the silver room. It is then explained that the dungeon such as the monster's corpse, magic stone, items will be taken by the temple. The only things that slaves able to obtain is a bonuses based on the clearing reward and value of the loot. Zephyr then offer Go the promotion. He will help Goth to advance through three more dungeons and Zephyr will get all of the monster's corpses. While waiting for the ID tag for transferring to become a hunter, Zephyr thoughts the great raid with the Temple Knights. That's scheduled to happen within next month. That's where they will discover the item that will cause a huge wave over the entire continent. And Zephyr determines to get his hand on it, and he needs to be on the raid party to change the future. When the procedures is completed, Zephyr has been told to collect all the essential equipment from the supply depot. So he walks there with Goth, while thinking that he enlisted to the hunter team after the raid participant list was announced, and the numbers of the raid party is about 20. In order to join, he needs outstanding achievements or connections in order to get into that party. As Goth explain about the depot, the team which hunts the demon god worshipper pass on them. So Goth grabs Zephyr's head telling him to bow down. Goth explain that they are the team of heresy examiners, the direct slaves of the examiner. And the leader of the party is Sahach who also called the mad dog. That's when Sahach suddenly calls them out, pointing his hand at Zephyr. He introduces himself, and when Goth tries to cover for Zephyr, Sahach releases his killing intent, and makes Goth backs off. But it doesn't affect Zephyr though, makes Sahach certain while there's no one else that would notice and since Sahach was blessed to have extremely heightened sense, he knows that Zephyr is a high level expert. It turns out that all new slaves are performance tested prior to being assigned a department. A test in strength and magic, they always give one the opportunity to battle for the hunting team, since they're always in need of new recruits. But such a high level expert was in the mining team, and was nominated to be transferred to the hunting team is simply unnatural and all of Sahach's members swiftly circling around Zephyr. Sahach then hold him off intending to ask a few questions. He asks whether Zephyr ever heard about a demon god worshipper. 
which it turns out only a handful of people knows about its existence, and no one knows them better than Zephyr, the demon god worshipper, believers that worship her the demon god Tartarus, who are the beings that would lead the humanity to destruction in the upcoming battle for human survival. They betray all of humanity. Sahach explained that he works under Lord Matthias, saying that he sees Zephyr are dangerous. With the simple words, Zephyr provokes them saying that they wouldn't be able to hold their honor as something unfortunate will befall them. So, Sahach activates a spell called Red Field which buffs him and the more the users of in on the field the buffs also increases, while Zephyr use a weird stance that Sahach had never seen before. In an instant, Sahach appears in front of Zephyr, uses Accelerate and starts trading blows with Zephyr. Sahach uses Trust which Zephyr easily dodge and prepares his own attack, but it only scratched Sahach's forehead. As Sahach rolling back away from him, he tries to kick his leg thinking that it worked. But Sahach realized that he just kicked a steel pipe ended up losing control of the fight. Zephyr then bombards him with punches, even with the buffs from the red field Sahach can't do anything against it and lost his sword. Fighting Sahach, Zephyr fails to notice the attacks that comes towards him, so he had no choice but to take it head on. The man with bulk build swinging around his steel ball. He asks Zephyr to play with him now, but Zephyr just mock him saying that he is just a pet that being raised. He throw it towards Zephyr, but Zephyr easily get of the way of the trajectory of the attack. As the steel breaks the stone road and start going to go towards Zephyr along with the continuous attack from the man, Zephyr is keep showing a swift movement to block everything that comes his way. But, as the time passes, everyone else start getting stronger in the red field while Zephyr keeps tire out. The bulky guy manages to tie Zephyr's hands with his chain, and that allows an opening for Sahach to strike Zephyr's back. Sahach says that the playtime is over, he tells Zephyr to just quietly beg for his life. Then with the buffs from the red field and accelerate, he dashes towards Zephyr but instead of finishing Zephyr in just one attack, Sahach plays with tied up Zephyr wounding him slowly. Sahach abilities has increased by 80%, saying that there is nothing Zephyr can do when faced with overwhelming speed like that. But what he doesn't know is Zephyr watch every moves he made where suddenly with a tied hands, Zephyr just stomp him, slamming him into the ground. Zephyr grabs Sahach's hair and lifting him up only to hit him again, adding that their teamwork is trash as Sahach keep flying around like a fly which makes the bulky guy had no opening to land an attack. Then Zephyr faced the bulky guy again, asking why he is so far away from him while having such a build. Zephyr then uses his aura to draw the man closer, and consecutively attack the other members at the same time with the steel ball. In the end, the heresy examiners are all defeated. Sahach asks Zephyr whether he is really a god worshipper, which Zephyr brushes off saying that Sahach doesn't have the right to hear the answer. Meanwhile, a man with a red hair watching them fight from the temple, as he is surprised to see Zephyr, thinking that Zephyr is someone that has been sent to hunt him. After the fight, Zephyr goes somewhere to deal with something else, walking towards an empty alley. The next thing that happens is he breaks down in pain, from a side effect of mana freezing when his mana is depleted. Then something shows up in the sky, marking the sign of the collection is about to start. Zephyr faces the spirit of Shylock, saying that under the authority of the god of loan, Uzra, adding that he has confirmed that Zephyr's mana has fallen to zero, the skill wall of iron will start its collection. It turns out the passive skill wall of iron isn't just a skill that increases defense and endurance. The reality is during the skill usage, the fatigue and damages will pile up in a debt. When the user's mana has reached zero, the accumulated damages are regained in full like debt from a lone shark. Mana adventurers have used that skill to challenge higher level dungeon, and met their untimely death. The god of loan, Uzra, the double-edged sword that feasts on the destruction of humans. Skylock then calculating the accumulated damages Zephyr had suffered. As the calculating completed, he summons a massive bell to stomp on Zephyr. But Zephyr knows it well, and start going for his emergency recovery potion he hides in his hand. When the bell about to fall right on top of him, he drinks the potion and Shylock confirm the mana Zephyr has, then cancel the collection and disappears. Zephyr then laugh at Uzra, saying that Uzra had underestimated him, adding that he comes prepared for things like that, since he is the pro that survived for a year even after humans went extinct. He doesn't forget to provoke Uzra, thanking him and giving him the middle finger before he passed out. While Uzra is so mad at him, having to learn that he had been played by Zephyr. The next thing Zephyr knows, he wakes up being tied in a bed. What welcomes him is the priestess that gave him loan. Due to the loan that Zephyr takes for buying all of the recovery potions before going to the dungeon is overdue for an hour. The priestess knows that Zephyr is going around doing dangerous things, making her so mad so she decides to collect the collateral for the loan which is Zephyr's organ. 
Now Zephyr is having a hard time remembering the name of the priestess as her men preparing to cut his arm off. Once he remembers it, he calls out to her and she tells her men to stop. She is surprised how come Zephyr knows her other persona and asks him who he is. Zephyr smiles as she tells her men to go out from the room. She then asks him again how in the world Zephyr knows that name, which he offers calling her the monster broker, White Rose. He then explained that she is a sister of the Shrine of Light, Anna Primrose, and the name of her other persona is the White Rose, who has a connection with the underworld and exchanges monster corpses, equipment, and information regarding people. It's crazy to attempt to clear a raid dungeon with only the cheap equipment one can find from the hunters. That's why he will need to negotiate with the priestess to get some gear. He then asks her to talk as he couldn't be happier that she has picked him up and tells her to untie him. Meanwhile, Sahatch wakes up angry throwing stuff around scaring the nurse that take care of him. He is so pissed remembering Zephyr telling that he has no right to know who Zephyr is and determined to kill Zephyr himself. Knowing the ruckus, Ned, his superior comes checking on him. As Sahatch tries to stand up giving him respect, Ned tells him to just lie down while also telling the healers to go out. Ned tells Sahatch that he heard stories about what happened to him. As Sahatch tries to apologize to him, Ned stops him talking by feeding him a knife into his mouth. He says that every single person that he came across today, for the entirety of tonight, was talking about the incident. Ned is angry that Sahatch dared, in front of all those slaves, get beat up like a useless dog. To make matter worse, Ned also mentioned that in the past two years, Sahatch can only manage to find two demon gods worshipper. Sahatch can only kneel in front of Ned, trembling to ask for one more chance, begging as he will do anything. Ned then tells him to not let those who have brought them shame live, as Ned will decide what will happen to him after he does that. And Ned gives him a mysterious package that contain a demon god worshipper starter pack. Ned claims he finds it in the room of the demon god worshipper, and explained to Sahatch that he doesn't have the leisure to choose the means of doing his tasks. In the end, the mad dog Sahatch, the enemy of all of those who are a part of the hunters, accepts to be one of the demon god worshipper. He is so ecstatic to have another chance claiming that he won't be the one that dies, instead, Zephyr will. It is then revealed that Ned is a disciple of a demon god worshipper official. He knows that Zephyr uses his school's martial art techniques, while the only people who know those techniques are his master and the four brothers. He plans to use Zephyr to get rid Sahatch, while thinking if Zephyr is not on his side, he can just get rid of Zephyr himself. Back into White Rose's dungeon, Zephyr takes out the Predator's corpse that he saves in his silver room. They both agree that he will give him another Predator's corpse and Rose will purchase items for him. Finishes dealing with White Rose, Zephyr goes back eating with his party. As the atmosphere getting awkward, Zephyr claims he doesn't drink horse piss and takes out an expensive and rare drink. He notices it from Rose's dungeon and asks her to give it to him. With that, they start getting to know each other as he thinks that he will be sure to create results with those guys, and they will help him take care of monsters around there. Whether he likes it or not, they are now in the same boat until the raid. Since he was on the same team as Goth in his past life, Zephyr already know what to do with him, as he only need a good teacher to improve. However, he should try to work with the other members as well. On the other hand, Dale, the blonde's member doesn't actually like Zephyr, and thoughts that soon they all will know the truth about what happened once time passes. He thoughts that Zephyr is a scammer that won't last long. The next dungeon they go to is located at the cave town Adeline, a town created hundreds years ago by building homes within the mountains. Inside full of spider web where Zephyr uses his mana detection. He spread mana outwards from his body then through the ground, and able to extend the range of his sense. The shape of objects, any sudden movement, an object with magical power instilled, Zephyr can sense everything as if he is touching it himself. Before they enter, Zephyr briefs them for a moment, he explains that inside the dungeon is a black steel spider. Counting out Zephyr, it's actually outside their capabilities though, so Dale against the idea entering the cave. Black steel spider, a spider-like monster who has high offensive stats, but an even higher defensive stat. At the worst of all, is the rate they are able to grow in numbers which makes a nest of black steel spiders is so difficult to deal with than a grown predator. But Zephyr says to him that Dale doesn't need to enter if he doesn't feel confident in Zephyr, adding that Zephyr can easily clear it by himself. Dealing with the Predator and a duel with the Heresy Examiner Sahatch, both of them weren't things that Dale witnessed himself, so he assumes that the dungeon isn't as dangerous as Zephyr says. Thinking about it, Dale makes a sloppy mistake touching the spider web, notifies the spider nearby. As the spiders attack him, Zephyr grabs Dale out of the way and tank the little spider mob that came. 
With Zephyr's passive, the spider unable to bit his hand, and he tells the members to gather close to him to deal with the spiders. Even though it's just small spider, the web is still hard to deal with, which will root them if they are not careful. Fortunately Zephyr instructs them to cover their weapon with cloth to shake off all of the spider webs and it's working. With a mana punch, Zephyr obliterate the all of the spiders that attack them. Zephyr thoughts how that is pretty normal happening to him, even in his past life. He constantly has to train soldiers, there were plenty of them that didn't know what to do, even if he told them the specifics. Since Dale was able to concentrate on taking care of the problem after messing up, it's not that big of an issue, and it's better for Dale to experience things for himself rather than Zephyr tells him everything. The next thing they need to deal with is the bigger spiders, while before Zephyr told them that the flesh near the stomach area is softer than the back, suggesting them to go for it. And they did, while the tank aggro the spider, Dale and Goth keep going for the spider's soft flesh. In the end, the three of the original party able to defeat the spider and Zephyr commends them for it, saying that it's not that bad for their first time dealing with the spider. While being broken and knows everything, Zephyr kills a truckload of spiders, while the three of them only manages to kill a single one. Zephyr tells them to regroup and eat, as what's left from the dungeon is the boss. Gold asks him what he used to be before being a slave, and Zephyr claims to be an explorer. Goth rephrases asking whether Zephyr was part of large guild or an apprentice of someone famous, which makes Dale also curious about it. It instead, reminds Zephyr that he is indeed an apprentice of someone great in his past life. But he doesn't tell them that, instead he asks them to finish quickly and breaking the spider legs to use as a weapon. He then tells them to go out as he will finish on his own, which they refuse to do so, saying that since they had gone that far, they want to stay and finish it together. And Zephyr explained that they are not going to do nothing as he give each of them a roll. So Zephyr goes inside the spider queen's nest, the breeding room for the queen has a special night spiders, where their sole duty is to protect their queen. From the silver room, Zephyr takes out a bunch of bags of ordinary flour. He then throws it towards the queen's guard. In an instant, Zephyr takes out a crossbow, shooting an arrow towards the spider. The flame burst within the thick flower will ignite the flower particles, causing a chain reaction. That is the principle of a spell called a dust explosion. Of course the spiders aren't that weak enough to die from something like that, and starts chasing Zephyr. So he runs while shooting poison arrows to it, making it screams in pain. Before Zephyr goes, he shows a pouch he takes from the spider where black spiders produce their web. He explains to them how to use it, lay traps with the webs where he tells them to, and stay on guard while they are waiting for him. The inside of the queen's room is going to filled with many more spider web than the outside, so they won't have a chance if they fight inside. So they need to lure the queen out, as a spider knight trapped within the web that the party laid. Zephyr takes out the spider leg that he broke before and starts attacking the spider knight. Then, what comes after is the queen itself, chasing Zephyr as it wants to devour him whole. As he nearly out towards the cave's entrance, the queen shoots a poison towards him. Fortunately he closely manages to jump out from the cave with the queen right behind him. He tells everyone to start attacking and with the spider legs in both hand, Zephyr also starts attacking it. Since the only one who can take the boss head on is Zephyr, he will be tanking from the front line, and the other party members will deal damage to it. Goth tells them that the queen's outer shell is the only hard thing while the inside is a bunch of nerves. So, with a knife he stabbed the queen's leg and hammer it to completely destroy its inner part. While Dale cover his blade with poison that Zephyr gave him, as he is feels excited failing to notice the queen's sting is coming at him. Fortunately Zephyr is able to hit its head hard and makes it miss its attack. He able to block everything that come at him, as the other members fails to follow what Zephyr is doing. Well, it's just like Zephyr said, where he explained that the queen spider will definitely stay on the spot that it initially lands on, because the queen usually stay in the breeding room to lay eggs, so it has a habit of limiting the movement of its back legs. And because of that, the space behind their legs are usually safe while most of its attack will be focused on targets in front of it. When the poison reaching its body, the queen starts rampaging, and Zephyr dashed forward right in the queen's stomach. He reaches the poison gland in her neck, pulls it outside then ties it up with his belt. With that, it won't be able to use its poison for like 5 minutes, and Zephyr starts climbing on its arm and jumps up to stomp its head, shocking it. In the end, they manage to slay the spider queen, while Dale is the only person that notices Zephyr is the one letting them have it, and now he knows that Zephyr is really that strong. Looking at the queen's corpse, Zephyr thoughts how he can't get rid of the sign that the spider queen was there, so he decides to just take the bigger spider's corpse to give to Rose. Then suddenly, Dale lay out a carpet to him asking him whether he wants to rest and let Dale to take care of the rest. 
Now, thinking about it, with the three of them, things aren't too bad, as Zephyr can save some energy to deal with the spiders and he can use them more in the future. But, they wouldn't be able to help him dealing with what's to come at him in the future. Back at the temple, Rose deals with the buyer who buy the corpse of the predator. It is unthinkable for her to do shady deals inside a temple during the middle of the day, yet it is quite interesting to see. Zephyr thoughts that maybe there isn't a single naive person in this world that thinks that all temples are holy places, void of corruption. He then explained that the money that worshippers donate to temple continues to pile up, resulting in entire cities being constructed around temples. That's all because the temple knights and battle slaves make sure that monsters don't approach them. Walking together, Rose tells Zephyr that they are quite lucky to find a good price for the predator, though she didn't thoughts that he would bring black spiders that quickly. With that, she also gives him a silver alchemist set that he needs to use later. Suddenly, Ned appears from behind calling out to them. It reveals that Ned is one of only 12 class 1 examiners. A skilled member acknowledged even by the temple, the direct superior of Sahach, and the one that beaten Sahach is right in front of him talking with Rose, which makes her anxious. He tries to take Rose away, intending to talk to her alone, but Zephyr gets in the way. Ned comments saying that now he remembers that Zephyr has a nice relationship with their Sahach. But Zephyr ended up provoking him, saying that his memories isn't that good, and he can't seem to remember useless people. They both then release their aura making it clashes, each with their own strength. It makes Rose freaks out, as she can't believe it the sharp magic energy come out from their aura clashing. And now she knows that Zephyr is not just a normal battle slave, which in par with the Temple Knights, or even beyond. Although Ned wasn't intending to go there to fight, he decides to have a little fun anyway. As they uses the same technique, Ned wants to know Zephyr's strength. But, as they are going to strike each other, Rose uses the temple authority to command them to kneel. Bound by the stigma of slaves engraving, they have to follow those who are marked by the followers of the light which is Rose. She then slaps Zephyr, asking who he is daring to do something like that, and she takes him away as she claims the need to teach him a lesson. As she walk away with Zephyr, she doesn't forget to tell Ned that Zephyr is her toy, and if he tries to do anything, she will kill Ned. Finding somewhere quiet, Rose explained that he can just fight everyone around him, adding that Ned is really dangerous as she is still shaking. Since Ned is a class 1 examiner, theirs isn't a single person that knows how he fights, since all of the people that saw him fight are dead. She then keeps nagging as Zephyr is now her money printer, after that she tries to apologize that she slapped him, and tells him to be careful as she won't be able to protect him outside of the temple. Zephyr then brushes her off, saying that he was just saying hi to Ned, adding if Ned really does something, there is nothing she could do anyway. He then goes to the lab leaving Rose behind. Meanwhile, Ned is in a bad mood that he has to feel the power of the engravement. He remembers when he's still with his master where he tells Ned to have a slave engravement, and tries to refuse it. His master explained to him that their brethren who infiltrated the temple as priests were revealed and executed, and the only thing the demon god worshipper can do is to engrave themselves, so the followers of the light won't suspect him. He also adds that the mission can only be done by Ned, as his master claims that they found a way to nullify the mark, but Ned is not going to use it now and will wait for the right time. In faraway village, Sahach comes inside, he asks around on how much people in the vicinity, which a random person says that is about 50 people. Fully recovered Sahach then uses a red flute, appears a demon behind him where it immediately after the people around. The demon is feasting on the people while Sahach bathes in blood, thinking that with his power now, he will claim his revenge against Zephyr. In the laboratory, Zephyr uses all kind of ingredients, as he boils that ingredients together with the Spider Queen's poison, resulting in Poison King's number 61. He asks Rose to help him with something, as he marks something on a wood from the Arkan tree that is hard as metal. She doesn't have the slightest idea on how Zephyr is planning with the thing he gave her. Finishes marking the wood, he uses his mana to punch the log, splitting them to needles. He explained that they are called acupuncture needles, as in the east, it's used for medical purposes. Zephyr dips them into the two kind of poisons for 10 minutes. Poison is very simple, its only use is to kill someone without much effort, or so everyone thought. But when the demon race invaded the world, and the gods confiscated the power they gave them, the only thing humanity can rely on is poisons. In an instant, Zephyr stabs bunch of needles into his hand, but, just because he is the maker of the poison, doesn't mean he is immune to the pain, and pain spread out to his whole body as the poison makes its way to his vein. Even with the great pain he feels, Zephyr immediately crosses his leg and cultivating. Internal energy flow quells the poison by circulating magic power, Zephyr can increase his stats to the next stage if he succeed. 
but if he fails, his physical body will shatter into pieces. To him, that can't even be called a crisis, nor can it even be called pain, remembering in his past life. He had to battle Ned to death, or has to be powerless in front of the demon god. A few hours later, in the northern forest near the Temple of Light, there is a magic flare shooting high up in the sky. There's a bunch hunters get chased by a pack of monsters, as they are not strong enough, they unable to deal with the monsters. One by one the hunters get eaten by the monsters like bird. The leader is the last man alive, and it's about 5 kilometers until he reaches the temple which will take over 20 minutes. As he stumbles, he looks at the flock of the bird, thinking that he will be reduced to ashes in less than 2 minutes. As the bird strikes at him, they get struck by a dagger from above. A star fall like meteor comes toward the man making a huge explosion. It turns out it's Zephyr, who already succeeds in tempering his physical body, as the mana can be seen leaking out from his body. The flock come after him, but as he is getting so much stronger than before, he twists one of the bird's neck and rip it apart as it was paper. Looking at the remaining monsters that broke from the dungeon, he counts there are 12 birds left. He uses 12 consecutive attack to them and with every attack it kills every bird that remain. After dealing with it, Zephyr asks the man about the location of the dungeon, which he points out telling Zephyr where it is and he instantly goes there. The man regrets telling Zephyr the location of the dungeon, as four of his party members are died inside, and three that got out, leaving him as the only survivor. He regrets it so much for not telling Zephyr that the dungeon is dangerous and he should have waited for reinforcements. But to his surprise, there are all kinds of screams can be heard from the dungeon. To put it simply, it sounds like a massacre. At the sunrise, Zephyr comes out from the dungeon, dragging the boss's head with him. With that, Zephyr thoughts how his body feels so light, as it seems his stats have increased by two or three folds, and his experiments is successful. After that, he shoots a green flare, a signal indicates the emergency crisis is resolved. On the other hand, Sahatch has finished massacre one village after another, and as soon he reach a certain level while also being so determined. Only then he will take his revenge on Zephyr. A few days later in the temple, the news that Zephyr single-handedly clear the uncontrolled Cicatrice Ness comes to the temple's head. What's more is the boss is a 30-meter long boss. Matthias, the senior heresy examiner 3rd division inform Lucius the head of the temple knights regarding the incident where both the field investigation and the survivor's testimony match. Zephyr is really making himself appealing in order to participate in the raid about 20 days from now. Matthias suggests to Lucius that they should investigate Zephyr to check if he is a demon god worshipper. But, Lucius prevent him to do so and order him to let Zephyr be, explaining that they won't be able to investigate thoroughly so as long as the demon god worshipper is useful to them. Lucius will use them anyway. Matthias is worried that the worshipper will steal from the temple, and that's the reason for Lucius to bring him in the dungeon. Inside, stored the Spear of Brilliant Light and the Winged Shield of Michael, Lucius spent a third of his wealth to obtain those items. He tells Matthias not to worry, as Lucius will be invincible in the raid. Back at the barrack, the trio finishes cleaning up themselves as Rose walk up to them. They bow down greeting her, but she just mock them asking them to pay off their interest on time. They were wondering why Rose, the demon sister is coming out from their room, which Zephyr can be seen wearing a new ring that probably given by Rose. They were surprised to see it, asking whether it was given by her, so Zephyr explained that it was a ring of purification, which will assist in his mana circulation and increases his magic defense. Zephyr can also use the skill called curse removal once a day. Rose asks him to tell her anything he needs, as she will get everything he might need, making Zephyr all fired up. It turns out that Rose heard of it from an informant in the black market, the assassin guild called Persephone. Using poison to increase their stats, they were legendary assassin that never missed their target with their remarkable martial arts skills and deadly poisons. Suspiciously good hunting skills and body reinforcement using poison, everything's starting to fall into place for her. His dear customer was an assassin from Persephone. Due to an internal conflict, Persephone fell to ruin a few years ago, but she heard that the high nobles where their customers are looking for the survivors and the poisons they used, and the nobles are willing to use colossal amounts of money to obtain the best talent and the best poison. Thinking about it, she thoughts that she should support Zephyr to her utmost to make him hers, but Zephyr knows that she seems to have severely misunderstood it. Well, for him, it's a good thing if she spreads rumors about him, so that Zephyr's old friend can find Zephyr on his own. Not only Rose misunderstood, but Goad also seems to misunderstood about the ring. He thoughts that Zephyr has a close relationship with Rose. But then suddenly, there's a knock on their door, so Dale see what it's all about, but there's no one in the hallway. 
only a piece of paper sticks on the wall, informing an emergency order for Goth's group. Looking at it, Goth wonders who would like to deliver an emergency order secretly like that. But when Zephyr takes a look at it, he knows that the signature and the contents are written by Ned. He knows that Ned prepares that invitation, so he tells the group that he will go by himself. Wearing the hunter's robe, Zephyr runs with lightning speed towards the location, thinking that there's about 20 days until the Temple Knight's raid. He explains that the dungeon the raid is going to is no ordinary dungeon. He called the Tomb of the Abominable Princess, one of the eight riddles of the world, the ruins of the ancient kingdom of Media. Due to the extreme difficulty, it has been attempted for over ten years, but no one has reached the boss room yet. Therefore, the criteria for the raid party participation rights is also complex. Be in a hunting team ranked fifth and above for the past year, or be the direct slave of a priest confirmed to participate, or those that received a recommendation letter from the direct slave. One can participate only by satisfying one of those conditions. It's impossible for Zephyr's team to gain enough achievements to reach the fifth rank by starting now. Therefore, in this life Zephyr will use Ned, because Ned is the direct slave of the heresy examiner Matthias. If Zephyr fools Ned and get his recommendation letter, then he can enter the raid party. There's no way that Ned, who received a mission that he cannot fail, would ignore Zephyr, who uses the same martial arts as him. And Zephyr knows that Ned must be already itching to test him. Does he think Zephyr is an ally sent by his master or a criminal who stole their sect's martial technique? If Zephyr is a force that Ned must bring along, he must know how strong Zephyr is. The voice that welcomes Zephyr instead wasn't Ned. It was Sahach, saying how dare Zephyr comes alone. So Zephyr wonders why Sahach is here, then blatantly tells him to go home, as Zephyr doesn't feel like playing with him. Sahach says that the pain from the scars on his mouth is because of Zephyr, adding that he hasn't been able to sleep soundly. So Sahach put up a stance, boasting as he will show Zephyr his new power. But with a lightning flash speed, Zephyr gets behind Sahach and knock him out. He tells how stupid Sahach is, shouting for the people around to come out as he will take them on, thinking that Ned is perfectionist and wouldn't test Zephyr with Sahach alone. But behind him, Sahach rises up, laughing. With the flute in hand, he is enraged that Zephyr ignores him again. So he summons the demon, claiming that he will kill Zephyr then slowly and painfully rip Zephyr to shreds. He commands Shoggoth, the demon in his possession to devour Zephyr. It is a surprise though, how can the biological weapon of the demon god worshipper, Shoggoth, would be there to see? He explains that the Shoggoth hibernate in the form of an egg and awaken when they hear the sound of an instrument imbued with the power of hypnosis. The Shoggoth is a mindless creature with an infinite appetite, and physical attacks have no effect on it. It gets stronger by absorbing the mana of the human it devours. These features already make it a tremendous threat, but they are not what makes the Shoggoth truly terrifying. Mind corruption. It begin from being in contact with the Shoggoth, one then experience the feeling of terror, similar to that of fear, and start to hallucinate. When one's mind corruption reaches 100%, one enters a state of frenzy. Human in a state of frenzy lose their reasoning and start killing everyone around them. It is the most optimal method of indiscriminate massacre. An artificial monster made by demon god worshippers to slaughter other human being with ease. But Zephyr is not afraid though, the Shoggoth bites him, while Sahach express how stupid Zephyr is, saying that Zephyr must want to die looking at the demon. Zephyr's eyes starts to turn red, a sign that he is about to enter a frenzied state and the mind corruption is about to reach 100%. But unknown to Sahach, Zephyr has the ring from Rose. Using the skill he removes the curse and completely incinerate the demon around him. Zephyr chokes Sahach saying that a long time ago, he only ever thought about keeping himself and those around him alive. Zephyr thoughts that was the obvious thing to do in this cruel world. But one day, other thoughts started to appear in his head. What would happen if he had more comrades that knew how to fight? What would have happened if the remaining humans started working together more? If that happened, the people he loves, would they have lived a little longer? That is why, in this life, Zephyr saved people that he could save, and gave those that have desire to get stronger a chance. However, Zephyr states that Sahach is not one of them. So, Zephyr starts rampaging to the miserable man. With full aura in hand he starts to punch Sahach that seemingly worthy of those punches. A skill begin with a barrage of blows, and with a final palm strike. Strikes the fog of blood that the opponent coughs up that ruptures the drops of blood and generates lightning. It is a skill known as the Dragon's Roar, feared by many in the East. Dragon King-style secret art, Thunderclap Palm. An instant death, it must have been very painful with all the electricity flowing through his entire body. 
the fitting death for a bastard like Sahach. Zephyr then picks up the flute, as a physical attacks don't work on the Shoggoth, so he plays a song that breaks the connection of magic power that connects the Shoggoth's cell. Suddenly Ned appears, as he is surprises that Zephyr is able to play the tune, adding that Zephyr knows quite a lot of things. Finally the time has come, Zephyr need to pass Ned's test and make him believe Zephyr is one of the demon god worshippers. That's the only way to change the future, and the debt in Zephyr's heart that he couldn't repay in his past life. He wants Ned to face a different end this time. In order to do so, Zephyr needs a chance to get closer to Ned by fooling him. Ned says that he has been watching the whole time and he has come to a conclusion that Zephyr is a target for elimination. So he dashes towards Zephyr with a lightning speed, going to strike him while Zephyr is ready with his stance of the secret technique. In a flash, Ned slashes Zephyr 14 times, but there is something weird that Ned feels in his hand, as all of his attacks miss Zephyr. Suddenly, there are three stone imbued with lighting aura going to him. It is shown how impressive Zephyr is, that he manages to slip through all of the strike then even counter-attack. Ned knows that there shouldn't be many people in this continent aside from his master that can surpass his sword speed, so he assumes that Zephyr must have used another method. But, Zephyr asks him why Ned is fighting an unarmed person with a sword. So he just dropped the sword and start his own stance as well. The two person is facing off with each other with the exact same martial technique. Using the same principle as the thunderclap palm, Ned wraps his body in electricity and gains explosive acceleration. But those from the same clan know how to counter that move. Zephyr uses the counter with the exact power to completely negate Ned's attacks. Now Ned knows that Zephyr is the real deal, thinking that it makes it even more confusing as only his senior brother and he, who have been thought the secret art of the Dragon King style. So he asks who the hell Zephyr is. It is then explained that Demon God Worshipper, Rank 9, Master of the East, Lone Dragon. A man from the east who crossed the land of the demon, the Sahara Desert, from the eastern continent to here, the Aslan continent. He who rose up to the executive rank of the demon god cult with his mysterious martial art technique, Dragon King's style, had two successors. One is the biological son of the lone dragon, named Strong Dragon and another is one that he picked up from the Aslan continent, Ned Streer. To gain a deep understanding through sparring, two successors are required. Therefore, no more than two is needed, since the principles of martial arts techniques must be kept confidential. So, it is suspicious that Zephyr knows the technique and obliterated the valuable asset of the cult, the Shoggoth. Zephyr then tells him that it's pretty simple if he uses his head a little, adding that he is a shadow apprentice, prepared for when one of the two apprentices dies. A shadow disciple that even the insiders don't know about is secretly trained in case something happens to the official successor. But, they are killed if the official successor safely develops and inherits their master's position. So Zephyr takes advantage of that situation. If Zephyr telling the truth, his identity should be the most well-kept secret. So Ned asks him on to why their master sent him there. And Zephyr explains that the orders he received are to hide his identity from other demon god worshippers, and to participate in the raid with his own strength. He adds that he is supposed to take over Ned's mission in case anything happens to him. Ned asks whether Zephyr knows what his mission is, and he answers that Ned are going to run away with the dragon heart. It is then explained that there is a magic stone formed in the heart of a dragon, called a dragon heart. It is the greatest item said to give one power comparable to that of a dragon. Zephyr says that there's no way the Temple Knights can follow the electrical acceleration of the Dragon King style. The moment Ned get his hands on the Dragon Heart, no one will be able to stop him from escaping. However, whatever Ned can do, Zephyr can do as well, adding that their master was anxious with just Ned on this mission. The reason why Zephyr defied his order and lured Ned there with something flashy was because the raid participation conditions were more complex than he expected. He doesn't want to take the hard way when the easy way is right in front of him. That's that but Zephyr adds that in truth, he personally have something to tell Ned. Zephyr comes closer and whisper it's about the blood tears. It's the stolen treasure of Ned's family, as he is following his master in order to reclaim it and take revenge on the temple. The only ones that know that are his master and Ned. In the end Zephyr says that he will tell Ned when he judged that Ned are trustworthy. So then Ned tells Zephyr that there's somewhere he need to go first, asking him to come along. On an abandoned building near the temple, Ned announces that he has brought the last one introduces Zephyr, sent by their master to assist in his mission to the demon god sect, adding that Ned has gone through the procedures to confirm Zephyr's identity. It turns out that Matthias is also one of the demon god worshipper, who will lead 40 of them that will follow the Lucius in the raid, while Matthias explained the plan again as Zephyr is the newly recruited worshipper. Zephyr thoughts it's so absurd that it's not even funny. 
They are different from Sahach who completely relied on items and monsters, or the past Zephyr who had nothing but ambition at that current time. The demon god worshipper are all very strong. They are elite force formed for the sole purpose of executing that mission. Zephyr thinks if all of them have that much strength, then why are they following the demon god? While Ned thoughts that the fact Zephyr revealed himself means that his master does not completely trust him let alone that Zephyr knows about the blood tears and thoughts that the one his master trusts may not be Ned but Zephyr. But he convinced himself to not waver as his master promised him that if Ned become an important person to his master, he will fulfill Ned's revenge. In a roundabout way, Ned needs his master for the sake of his revenge. So for that purpose he needs to get his hands on the dragon heart no matter what. Also, if Zephyr is a shadow disciple who has been groomed to become Ned's replacement, Ned assumes that Zephyr may desire to aim for Ned's neck. With that, Ned tries to shake hands with Zephyr thinking if Zephyr wants to snatch away his life, it's better to keep Zephyr close to him, rather than keeping his distance. Zephyr thoughts that if he can shift Ned trust to him, Ned will be a great help in overcoming everything that will happen in the future. Zephyr had countless connections that disappeared in vain, among them, the first one he will pick back up is Ned. Back in his past life, Zephyr gets threatened by Ned where he is injured, and Ned asks him to choose whether he will help Ned escape the cave by learning the ultimate martial arts technique or to die and become beef jerky for him. Zephyr's first connection that made him into the strongest human is his master who taught him the Dragon King style, Ned. On the next day, the names of the raid party members that will clear the tomb of the abominable princess dungeon were announced. Everything is according to plan, as Zephyr should settle out all his own arrangements now. Although their time together was short, Dale understand that Zephyr has a goal, and that goal is much bigger than anything that they ordinary people can imagine. Zephyr tells him that as long as he trains himself to death, there will come a day when he will be able to walk alongside Zephyr, asking him to follow Zephyr then. With that, the bid their farewell, and now the two people who should be dead by now are alive, looking at their shining eyes. Zephyr feels good since it means that he didn't make mistake. However, those guys are as good as dead as of now, because three years from now, if the demon god worshippers succeed in their summoning, many people including those guys will lose their lives. To stop that from happening, Zephyr must get his hands on the dragon heart. The next one is to comes to Rose for equipment. The dungeon he is going crawled with living and moving skeletons. They do not feel pain since they are already dead and their bodies made up of only sturdy bones. Therefore, to defeat a skeleton, one will need to break them with blunt weapon. Additionally, Zephyr picks up a sword called Twilight Long Sword, as the things he needs to worry about in the dungeon aren't mere skeletons. The Temple of Light that's trying to end the 10-year dungeon clearing attempt, and the demon god worshippers who will jump into the fray for the survival of the cult. Zephyr must push through them all and obtain the Dragon Heart. In other words, the entire party is his enemy. And one more thing, Ned still doesn't trust Zephyr yet. For now, even if he is telling Ned the truth, it won't be easy to convince him. So, if Zephyr fails to persuade Ned, and they end up fighting, it won't just end in the middle this time like it did before, because it will be until one of them dies. Now, an enchanter named Angelia comes inside. She will be imbued the sword that Zephyr takes with divine power, and it turns out that she is one of the greatest enchanters in the temple. With that, she enchants all of Zephyr's equipment. Though he need to prepare to fight his party members, he can't slack off on preparations for the dungeon. And with that, his basic preparations are complete. Rose pays Angelia with the enchants, totaling 3,000 gold. Looking at it, Zephyr is surprised to learn that backdoor enchantment by Angelia only that much. He thanks Rose that he doesn't need to pay commission. And it turns out that Rose already prepared for some losses to score some points with Zephyr. Now, Zephyr thanks her again as she already helps him that much, saying that Rose was probably short on time as well, which makes her blushes, and there she goes the first victim of Dragon God Zephyr. Then, he tells her that he has no more money left, breaking Rose apart in an instant. He claims that he is unable to find anything worth money, and he doesn't have anything he can give to Rose. In the end, he takes out the two poison he cooked. Looking at them Rose freaks out, thinking that it was the deadly poisons of Persephone, so she begs him to give them to her. After giving it to her, Zephyr tells her to not sell them to the contact named Mole as he is dangerous, so, he bid his farewell to her, and goes back. The next morning, the party lined up in the training ground, and there are quite a lot of people that will go to the dungeon. Among all those people, only a few survived in Zephyr's past life and it will be no different this time as well. The party leader, Temple Knight Captain, Lucius arrives greeting everyone that lined up. The raid party members are as divided into vanguard and rearguard team, 
and they will be under the command of four individuals. The Healer Captain, Arno, Rearguard Captain, Leona, Vanguard Captain, Matthias, and the Party Captain, Lucius, the bearers of the stigmata that given by the gods, and called the Saint. He says that with that raid, they will put an end to the ten-year-long dungeon clearance attempt. With that, he tells them to endure the harsh training that begin today. As the party members cheer up with him, praising the almighty area. At the special training ground, Shrieking Peak, Zephyr climbs up the cliff, thinking that the glory for the party members is only a gimmick. However, the true nature isn't some virtuous goal such as the action of a hero or for humanity, but purely for business. They engage in politics to gain the dungeon clearing rights, gather party members, gather investments for the endless expenses such as costs for labor, equipment, potions, etc. The preparations are finally finished and the dungeon is cleared after several years. Once the dungeon has been safely cleared, road and cities are built on the newly secure lands, and investors can reap the various benefits including the increase in value. That's the kind of large-scale business it is. The third great temple of the Temple of Light is nothing more than an outpost for St. Lucius to clear the dungeon. As the people who participate in the raid are nurtured and those selected for the raid are the elites who have received daily training. In the training ground, the instructor explained to assume the light she summoned as the enemy's magic attacks. Those who are hit three times are dead, so they need to raise their hand and come out. So the mock battle is begun, the soldiers is having a hard time, even though it was only a training. But, Zephyr easily pierces through the puppet, and Ned instructs him to not reveal the Dragon King style in a place like that. Together, they goes toward the golem. With his nimble feet, Ned jumps around from the puppet to the golem. Simultaneously, they work together to defeat the golem along with the puppets. The training to eliminate 500 golems is complete, so they can have a 15 minutes break. Arno is surprised to see both of Zephyr and Ned is doing better than he expected. Evaluates the level of the slaves is higher than the previous raid. He then uses his light magic to completely treat their injuries and recover their fatigue. He adds that as long as the healers are around, they will be able to do four weeks worth of training in the span of two weeks that they had. With that he starts the training again. When the evening falling, Ned refuses to eat the food that the temple provided. Zephyr brings a plateful of food for them, but Ned still refuses, saying that he needs to maintain his weight to maximize his acceleration. So Zephyr decides to do the same since he will have to carry out the mission if Ned fails. Then Ned questions Zephyr whether he's still planning on outdoing Ned. Zephyr asks him not to make such a face, as he has brought them something good, which is the expensive drink to warm them up, so they can move around better. Drinking at the sunset, Ned asks Zephyr on how much does he know about Ned. At first, he thought that Zephyr was trying to eliminate Ned to take his place. However, Ned realized that Zephyr has no desire to harm him during the training period. Adding if Zephyr knows about Ned's deepest secret, he should have demands things now, but he didn't. So Ned asks again what Zephyr means by saying that Zephyr will tell him when Ned deemed trustworthy. Looking at him, Zephyr thoughts that Ned is different. At first, Ned was blindly trying to kill him, yet being together for two weeks had an effect on their relationship. So Zephyr tells him that he is asking the wrong question. What should he ask should be where the blood tears is and who has it. So Zephyr tells him where the sword is and who has it. It is explained that the Strier Barony's heirloom, the demonic sword Blood Tears. It is a trophy that their ancestor obtained after defeating the demons of the desert. Once their ancestor offered up that sword to the king, he gave their family the title of Baron and ordered them to watch over the Blood Tears for generations to come. Ned's father tells him that one day, Ned will become a Baron of the Strier family, as he will also inherit that honorable mission when that time comes. And his father encourages him to become a knight that befits that sword. But then, the temple came knocking, the baron screaming for the temple to give back the sword as he only put the baron title and estate as collateral for the loan. But not the blood tears. The priest explained to him that he given up his baron title, and the blood tears belongs to the baron, so he no longer have any authority for it. Which makes him angry then unsheathes his sword to strike the priest. But the temple's knight interrupt the attack. A knight chops both of his hands and the other stabs him in the stomach. While Ned can only watch his father getting killed in front of him, when the priest explain if his sword had reached the priest, harm the son of Bishop who is noble blood, they would had to execute his son as well. That's 12 years ago, when the dungeon investments start to become excessive, but raids continued to fail. That caused the economic crisis, dungeon bubble break. The Temple of Light made a fortune by selling deformed products, deceived investors, and maximized their benefits. Like Ned's father the investor that bought products through investment, 
become penniless and forced onto the streets. That was all caused by the high-ranking priests, especially Priest Aldian, who scammed Ned's father, using their friendship as leverage and even took away his life. Ned searched all over the world for the blood tears, the symbol of his family, that he hasn't even heard a rumor of. What's shocking to him is that his master, the one who possessed the blood tears. So Zephyr explained that not long ago, master told him about the identities of the demon god cult and the twelve apostles, the executives of the cult. The cult leader and half of the twelve apostles are high-ranking priests of the Temple of Light. As they depart into the dungeon, Zephyr plants the seed of doubts that Ned's master plans to offer the cult leader the dragon heart that he bring him. If that happens, they will no longer be able to touch his body forever, and Ned's revenge will go down the drain. Zephyr ultimately saying that they were deceived from the start. To say that Ned's master, who he considered to be his family, has been deceiving him. He thinks that there's no way he can believe that. But, if it's not the truth, Ned questioned how does Zephyr even knows the words that his master said to him. So, he come into a crossroad, whether to believe his master or what Zephyr's said. Before long, they arrive at the gate of the tomb of the abominable princess. Lucius opens the massive gate to the dungeon that the temple had been trying to clear for the past ten years. The dungeon is divided into nine floors, but, as they are already familiar with it from the last ten years, the party easily go through the gatekeeper of the eighth floor. This time, even though the monsters appear with different aura than the upper floors, they still excited to face them. Matthias leading expresses how he will have fun. On the same time at the Temple of Light, Bishop Alponso, Lucius's uncle speaks with another priest, saying that they are in trouble since all of the combatants had left for the raid, thanking the other person for lending them his defense force. While Lucius was away on a dungeon, the ones who arrived at the third parish great temple were the temple knights dispatched from the capital parish, and the head of leader is Cardinal Aldian, one of the demon god worshipper. So the battle between the mobs of the undead with the mixed party of Temple of Light and the demon god worshipper. Going deeper into the eighth floor, appears another mob of bone golem which several times bigger than the ordinary skeleton. With a single attack from the golem, the shock wave blasting so strong sending several party members flying. The priestess cast her magic, called the chains of light to restrain the golem. It works for a moment, and the party starts attacking it, while simultaneously dealing with the skeleton warriors. Unfortunately the golem breaks the chain, rampaging to the party, then Matthias uses a light magic, praying to the goddess to shine a beam of light to coat his sword. In an instant, he strikes the golem twice making a cross with his sword coated with light aura. He then tells everyone to keep their focus, explaining that if the bone golem is nearby, the summoner of the golem must also be around. It is a skeleton mage, a mid-rank skeleton monster. It can shoot magic and can order skeletons of lower rank than itself. The mage will continue making the bone golems if they don't kill it first, so they need to kill it fast before there is too many members get hurt. In any case, they have to get closer to the mage for the attacks from the rearguard to reach it. But Matthias is looking for ancient tombstone. As if he doesn't find it, the battle will become a complete mess until he finds it. Suddenly, Lucius comes forward, telling everyone to step aside with the Spear of Brilliant Light and the Winged Shield of Michael in hand. He uses a light beam to completely decimates the whole skeleton army. In the process, he also break the Ancient Tombstone, an artifact that supplies magic power to the skeleton mage. Now, both Zephyr and Ned witness the power of the saint and a two million gold worth of equipment. And with that, they cleared the eighth floor. And before proceeding to the last floor, they take a break while Zephyr sneaks around to somewhere he knew from his previous life. He looks around for a certain secret mechanism in the dungeon until he finds it. Meanwhile at the temporary conference room, Lucius briefs the captain about the ninth floor's layout and the boss in there. With that, they need to destroy all of the tombstones of each area, if not they will fail again like last year's raid. Once they reached the entrance of the boss room, they were surrounded by an undead army from the secret passages, and countless lives were lost. Now, they cannot repeat the same mistake as before and must eliminate all variables, even if it takes time. In this raid, the most important missions in the raid is to conserve as much of as Lucius's stamina as possible, and escort him to the boss room in his best condition. It's possible for him, in his current condition to defeat the monsters. As a year ago in the boss room, looking at a single monster was enough to break their morale. The gatekeeper of the boss room is so strong that they cannot break through. Suddenly, at the site appears a Shoggoth that surprises Matthias as the demon god worshipper did prepare five Shoggoths to carry out their mission. But, right now is not the time for it. At that moment, the reason why all four leaders looked at the same place was due to some unknown instinct or intuition. All the strong possess a danger sensor more sensitive than anyone. 
Zephyr presses a secret button, where a helm appears and he starts to roll it. As he did, the layout of the ninth floor is changing. The floor is block moving in a bizarre way. Back at the gathering of demon god worshippers, the day before the raid party member were announced, Matthias explained the plan again to the members. He reveals that Lucius borrowed the legendary item of the Pope called the Stake of Faith. Lucius plans to use it on sticking it between the doors. After that the demon god worshippers have to take care of Lucius and push him to the position farthest from the entrance. Then, after Ned steals the dragon heart and slips past the doors, only then they will awaken the Shoggoths. As long as they are able to create an opening, the boss will take care of Lucius for them. After that they will come out of the dungeon and report to the temple that they failed to clear the dungeon. With that, he supplies the demon god worshippers with a vial that will allow them to remove the slave's brand and also the flute that will control the Shoggoths. That's when Zephyr activate the contraption. He evaluates it won't turn into a complete disaster with all those healers, and calls out the Shoggoths. Before he goes, he shouts at the party to encircle them so it's easier for the healers to purify. So Zephyr activates the contraption, while at the same time, the four leaders looking at what he is about to do, while Matthias can only wonder what Zephyr is doing over there. It is explained that three years after the raid, the dungeon was being used to avoid the demons. It is a protective contraption the inner structure of the dungeon by moving every single structural material in the tomb. Because Zephyr has spent time in that place before, he knows its layout very well. As Zephyr runs deeper into the dungeon, Lucius uses the slave's brand on Zephyr as he thoughts that Zephyr will have no choice but to follow the command. But Zephyr doesn't stop. Matthias knows that Zephyr already have the secret vial with him which enables him to remove the slave's brand temporary. So he becomes so enraged by it. Using the light magic, he intends to cut Zephyr up. But Ned comes with his light speed to strike Matthias. After that, Ned also runs following Zephyr's path. As of now, he has succeeded blocking Matthias' attack. But there is one more attack. Lucius uses his beam of light from his spear towards Zephyr. But Zephyr knows the layout of the dungeon very well. He uses the timely mechanism to dodge the beam where the stone block appears right after he run through it. Not only that, Zephyr uses his cheat skill called Strong Luck, where he can only use it for three times. At this moment, Luck is on Zephyr's side. As Ned catches up to him, he commends Ned that he is able to catch follow him up. And Ned give him back the favor, as he is saying whatever Zephyr can do, Ned can do as well. Now, it looks like Ned has made his decision to trust Zephyr. Back at the training ground, Zephyr explained to Ned if he steals the dragon's heart and bring it out to run away with it by himself, Ned will definitely die. The only option to stay alive is to clear the boss with only the two of them. Ned is angry thinking that Zephyr is only spouting nonsense, but Zephyr tells him to sit down as he will let him in on Zephyr's amazing plan. After he finishes, Ned thoughts that the plan is indeed has a high chance of success, the problem is credibility. So Ned asks, what does Zephyr means by saying that Ned will definitely die if he run away with the dragon heart? Ned explains if he runs with the dragon king style no one will able to catch him. Moreover, what if he becomes the owner of the dragon heart? So Zephyr tells him that the dragon heart can only be absorbed using a special method. If Ned recklessly absorb it, he will definitely die. Secondly, the one who came to the third parish temple as the carrier is Carneal Aldian. If Ned doesn't show up at the meeting, Aldian's twin knights will hunt him down. The twin knights are one of the ten strongest people in the entire continent. Not only that, the entire demon god worshipper will also hunt Ned down. Now, Ned decides to trust Zephyr with his plan, so they start bouncing around in the chaotic dungeon that constantly changing its shape. Is nemesis, Cardinal Aldian was an executive of the demon god cult, and he is close enough to his master to be put into such an important operation. It wasn't enough for Aldian to destroy Ned's life with a scam and to think that he has been deceived his whole life. Ned looks so furious with the thoughts of the demon god worshipper. A skeleton golem appears in front of them, so Ned uses his Dragon King style technique to kill it in an instant. He determined to destroy all of the demon god worshippers in the Temple of Light. Zephyr tells him to just focus on running, explaining that they will fail if they were even a second late. Zephyr understand how Ned feels, however, he can't afford to be swept along by his emotions. Ten seconds until Zephyr's strong luck runs out, they are about to face the gatekeeper of the boss room. The monster notices them and asks where is his heart is, not only that, he starts releasing his skill to strike them. As the aura blade comes toward them, Zephyr tells Ned to jump and that's when they see the gap that leads to the boss room. So they evades the gatekeeper and slip into the gap at the last second, when the gap starts closing. In the end, they manage to get into the boss room. Ned is confused as he should be surprised or confused to be able to think they actually entered the boss room like that. 
As Ned is confused looking for the boss, a sound calling out to them, asking who they might be. She says that he can still feel the energy of her night outside the door, wondering who they are to interrupt the slumber of the royal family. Outside of the boss room, the party finishes dealing with the Shoggoths. They regroup and confirming the number of the survivors. Lucius is wondering whether Zephyr didn't have a slave's brand from the start or he has something that nullifies the brand's effect. Moreover, right after the Shoggoth suddenly appeared, he activated some sort of contraption. All of that events are telling him one thing. An unknown number of demon god worshippers are hidden in his party. Lucius then asks Arno about Ned and Zephyr. Arno informs him that Zephyr entered the party through Ned's recommendation, and Ned is from the unit directly under Matthias. While Matthias is enraged with wondering whether they ran away because they were scared of facing the boss and after making that much of a mess, he then commands his party to cease the operation and to get ready to kill or be killed. As Lucius and his party are already prepared for the battle between the Temple of Light and the demon god worshipper, Lucius asks Matthias whether he has anything to say, where he express whether they really need something like words between them. Inside the boss room, Ned can't believe that the abominable princess, named Princess Eurydica who massacred her people 1000 years ago, was such a serene and beautiful person. But, she can't hide her sorrowful eyes, that bewitch Ned into wishing to lessen her sorrow. As Ned about to fall for the trap, Zephyr holds him off, to think that he would fall for such a basic illusion. Zephyr says that Ned is idiot. Then, Eurydica laugh, saying what a shame that he missed her chance to eat Ned, while changing to his true form. The serene and beautiful princess, changed into a terrifying demon that lusting for blood. Welcoming the attack, Zephyr mocking Ned saying that she is his girlfriend. Ned tells him to shut up, as he is already out of the illusion. A skill called Dark Hand, the red hand that absorb one's stamina, and the blue hand that absorb one's magic power. The great magician Eurydica can create hundreds of those hands at once. According to the Dungeon Clear report that Zephyr secretly read in his previous life, many party members fell prey to that skill and become Eurydica's potions. Lucius, against her, who endlessly absorbed stamina and magic power to recover, managed to miraculously defeat her in a half-dead state. Meanwhile, Zephyr can feel his yearning gaze for Zephyr's failure, as if he has been waiting for that moment. At the face-off between the Temple of Light follower and demon god worshippers, Lucius tries to interrogate Matthias with conviction. For now, it's impossible for Matthias to escape using the slaves, as he doesn't know the dungeon structure after it changes, so he has no other choice but to fight Lucius to death. But it's a terrible matchup for Matthias, as the saint is equipped with legendary great items, and with the healer captain on top of that the battle priests. But Lucius's party still don't realize the demon god worshipper in their side so Matthias evaluate that he still has a chance. He gives a gesture to his follower to drink the vial, and Matthias speaks to Lucius to settle that with a duel like nobles. If Lucius can beat him, he will tell on everything he knows. But Matthias hints is too late, as Lucius uses the slave's brand to commands the slaves to attack Matthias. With that, the demon god worshippers won't carry out Matthias's commands anymore. In another words, Matthias can't stop their attacks without defeating them. It's truly a shame though as they were been friends since Lucius first entered the academy at 12 years old. They overcame countless trials together until now, as he is 32 years old, and are close enough to understand each other without words. But to think that Matthias betrayed Lucius is beyond him. Now, Matthias has no other choice but to kill all of the demon god worshippers. From their corpses, come out the insects that the demon god worshippers grow in their stomachs, the branded worm. Lucius express how disappointed he is, as he left the selection of the slaves to Matthias because Lucius trusted him, only to recruit the slaves from the demon god worshippers. Arno thoughts how Matthias is undeniably a force to be reckoned with, as it took him 30 seconds to take care of over 30 slaves. But, the Saint Lucius is simply stronger, with a light chain he tied Matthias for judgment. He knew it wasn't going to be easy but to think that Matthias's sword didn't reach Lucius even once. He wonders whether that was the fate decided by God. Lucius wants to at least hear Matthias's reason for the betrayal, but he refuses to answer and going to break the Stone of Revelation, a thing that allows Matthias to turn himself into a demonification form. Matthias thoughts if his fate is to be manipulated by the hands of God, and being human doesn't allow him to resist them, he determined to detach his life as human. Knowing that Matthias only demonified just earlier, Lucius commands his force to start attacking, so the priest all uses a light magic towards him. But it's useless though, in front of Matthias, their attack is gnaw, and in an instant Lucius appears in front of him going to strike him with his overpriced equipment. With a skill called Judgment, he attacks Matthias, the shockwaves go so long that it looks like Matthias just being blasted open. 
but it can't be further from the truth, as Matthias hold the overpriced spear with a single hand of his. That surprised the party, so Leona feels the need to help Lucius. She thoughts that if a legendary item doesn't work on Matthias, she need to use the stake of faith that Lucius has trust her with. As she moves forward, she fails to find it. It turns out that Ned already steals it. He expresses how truly amazing Zephyr's plan is with the inclusion of the stake of faith. They both keep evading the attack from Eurydica as they count down the timer for 15 seconds. It revealed to Ned that it's true and how spot on Zephyr is, as he told him to evade the skill for 15 seconds and the skill disappears. It is explained that because magic skills required the user to calculate complex magic formation in their brain, it will melt from overload if multiple large skills are used in succession. One must use smaller skill between the large ones to cool down the brain. Now, their chance come to attack, one step back and three steps to the side they evade her. Together they climb the twig that Eurydica uses to attack them. Even now, Zephyr can't foresee everything even if he knows the future, and a battle is a series of endless unexpected situation. That is why he prepares various equipment and ultimately the Twilight Sword. Now the most important thing is how much he has accumulated until then, whether he has enough items, whether he has comrades that he can trust, whether he has an unwavering mentality even in the face of adversity, whether he has to overcome all kinds of situations that abruptly come his way, made the Zephyr now who can handle this moment, this fight. Together they perform the Dragon King Sword Technique, Cloud Dragon Ascension. Now, just because they manage to behead Eurydica, the fight doesn't necessarily over, while she changes her form and Zephyr grins as he waits that moment. That's when he gives the hint to Ned so he dashes towards her. As the day before, Zephyr explained that even though both of them use their secret art, it'll be impossible to slay Eurydica, as she becomes so much stronger when she goes to her second form. But she can't move nor use any skill while transforming, so they need to aim that moment to take out the stake of faith and drops it right on top of her. It's an item that reacts to malicious energy by releasing its own strong divine energy. Now the stake will deal the majority of the damage. In the meantime, they just need to prevent her from trying to remove the stake. Even if it's a legendary grade item, the amount of divine energy it has is limited. When it's all used up, it just becomes an extremely heavy scrap of metal. So Lucius, who spent a fortune to borrow it from the Pope, probably didn't think to use it for attacking. Well, it's not Zephyr's money anyway, so they keep attacking her like lunatic. A while later, the stake of faith's ignition stopped, meaning that it sensed the enemy has been incapacitated. She was so tenacious that she didn't give them any time to rest. The weapon that Zephyr's prepared are all out of divine power enchantment. As Zephyr drinks potions up to replenish his mana, he wonders what would happen to Lucius considering that Matthias will demonified. Well, he has the goddess of light as his backer, so he won't die that easily anyway. Looking at the pity state of Eurydica, Ned saw an eye that crawling outward, while Zephyr notices and tells him to leave it, as she won't be revived in her current state, and if she dies, the door will open and the gatekeeper will come in. He then throws potion to Ned, telling him to recover his health and asks him to look for the dragon heart. Ned thoughts that the boss of a dungeon called one of the eight riddles of the world, defeated by only two people, what a miracle. He consider himself to be quite strong, but nowhere near strong enough to create such a miracle and it can happen only because of Zephyr. It's gone beyond surprise or suspicion. It's as if Zephyr is looking down on everything from above. Now, the guard outside the gate is agitated. As Eurydica is calling on to him, the two people inside can feel the aura that the guard extruding. Now, Eurydica is waking up again, swirling her aura like a twister. Ned asks what the hell is that, which Zephyr claims that he doesn't know. That wasn't in the Lucius's dungeon clear report that Zephyr read in his past live. He assumes that the future changes as he didn't kill the guard. Now, Eurydica looks completely different from before. Not only that, she seems doesn't simply rampaging around and changes the layout of the room to take the stake away. Both Zephyr and Ned don't wait for what about to happen though, they simply start attacking her again. But they were flabbergasted with the fact that they don't feel any slashing from their sword. Zephyr realizes that is the ancient magic of Media, space distortion. She summons her twigs again from the floor, fortunately Ned manages to dodge it. But she sets her eyes on him though, as she chases him and he doesn't have enough momentum to dodge another attack. So Zephyr prevents her to finish him, with the web from the Spider Queen he tied her up. Not only that, he also drag her to come to him, making her seems taunted. Using a basic mana application technique to reinforce his hand, Zephyr swing her away from Ned. As a defensive skill, space distortion is invincible, but since it distort the space around the user, the user's attack also won't reach the opponent's. Therefore, the moment when she is about to attack is also their chance to attack. 
Iridika tries to hold herself from Zephyr that is trying to swing her around. Instantly Ned comes right in front of her, vertically slashes his sword to cut her twigs. For a moment he felt happy as the attack went through. But then, he also gets slashed by the sword attack as she uses a magic called Black Mirror, an ancient skill that reflects damage she receives 300% to the attacker. After that, she summons the Dark Hand to absorb Ned's stamina where Zephyr appears behind her to punch her. That's not all, as she keeps her eyes on Ned, Zephyr uses the Thunderclap Palm to her. As she tries to do something, Zephyr uses an Eastern technique to press her pressure point to block her mana flow. Even though it doesn't do damage, he will have time to counter her. That makes her tries to keep her distance away from Zephyr, so he shoots the web again to prevent her doing so. As she comes to him, he uses the thunderclap palm again. This time, he uses a rosary engraved and allows Zephyr to use heal with every bead and uses it to help Ned recovers. Though, because he lost concentration, he got hit by her twig, blasting him several meters away. Being in rage, Eurydica uses a massive spell on him, not one but multiple spirit ball that makes his blood shiver, that decimates everything in the room they were fighting. Meanwhile, at the temple Rose dropping a teacup, thinking of something must have happened. As she thinks about Zephyr, she wishes that she should have given him a higher capacity rosary and wishes that he would be okay. But it can't be further from the truth as Zephyr got heavily injured while Ned is incapacitated. Zephyr thoughts how ridiculous that is for him to fail the eight challenges of the world, as he could have easily taken care of her before his regression. He feels how it really hits home to how worthless he is at this time. He used up all of consumable items he prepared, and all of his weapons and defensive gear are destroyed with nothing left. With perks of the skill of iron, is just that the god that aims for Zephyr's failures. Divine beast egg that he doesn't know what might come out from. Strong luck that he has limited use and he already decided where he will use the remaining two chances. Sword of light and revive that will traps him after he used them. Those are neither goodwill nor gifts from the gods. As he remembers how the angel tells him, that it's all just for entertainment for them. Their only use is to keep him tied down as they watch him despair while being surrounded by hope, while in truth they are just lashes. When Eurydica comes to him, intending to end his life, he thinks whether he is really going to die there, and all of his plan is bound to crumble no matter what he does. Zephyr decides to do something, and starts writing on the floor, a things that will make all of the god feel like complete sheet. That's when the angel, Mercedes appears asking what is the meaning of what he did, adding why does a human like Zephyr know about the blasphemous symbol? In turn, Zephyr feels happy that he cast a bait and caught quite a big fish. The proof that the gods lost disgracefully in the past, that's all what Zephyr knows about that symbol. What he is certain about it is that the gods decides it to be a taboo, and that anyone who even draws that receives divine punishment and dies. Divine punishment is the principle of the world that automatically punishes those who break the taboo. In other words, the moment he complete that symbol, he will die according to the principle of the world. As of now, Zephyr unable to sense Eurydica, thoughts that Mercedes must have put a barrier, and now he can recovers a bit of his health in the meantime. She then asks again how can Zephyr knows about the symbol, so Zephyr extorts her, asking her to pay if she wants to know that. That stupefied her for a moment, but then she is mad, real mad, really really mad, which makes Zephyr unable to finish the symbol. She said that even though he gained the interest of the gods, he is not a saint nor an angel. The fact that he even attempted to draw the symbol has infuriated countless gods, and they are crying out for her to kill him. Zephyr calls her bluff, asking her to kill him, adding that she can try and whether she can handle the consequences, as if he knows that she doesn't have the right to do that in the first place. He knows that by reading through the regression cheats that the gods gave him carefully, he can tell what they want from him. Zephyr claims that he doesn't want to do that sheet anymore with that stupid perks that the gods gave him, expresses that he probably better off if he just die there. He then shouts out to the god, asking them to bet big while they still have the chance, and if Zephyr dies now, there will be no human like him. The god and goddess are watching as Zephyr express his thoughts. As the goddess of life is laughing, expresses how amusing he is, and the light comes down to earth, shines Zephyr up telling the angel the message. As the light subsides, the time resumes and Eurydica looks so excited that she kind of really wants his meat. But her left hand suddenly gets obliterated in a horizontal slash coming her way to slash the red and dark hand. It turns out that area, the goddess of light gives Zephyr the sword of light, which makes the other gods rioting to her. But she just say that she will add another weapon from her treasury to Zephyr later. Arcaris, another great gods, expresses how he did something unbefitting of one of the great gods. Though, he thoughts that he doesn't know what the demon god wants with Zephyr, so he will keep his eyes on the matter. Meanwhile, Zephyr faces Eurydica third form with the Sword of Light. 
even if she was a great magician, there's no way that a human's magic can block a divine artifact. It is one-sided massacre even Eurydica's ancient magic is no match for the light. As he uses the exclusive skill to strike the evil magic from Eurydica, that in turns waking her up. In the end, she falls into Zephyr's arms. With the curses removed, she is able to think and talk. She expresses how it feels like a dream, asking who he is to be able to drive away the evil within her. He confesses that he is her successor, one of the twelve heroes, Zephyr. A flashback to when Eurydica is still a human, a man presents the dragon heart to her, a heart that formerly belonged to the black dragon Kaiseris. She accepts it, and along with the heart, her heart also got snatched by the man. And at that moment, she believed there would be nothing but happiness for them. But she was foolish. She explained that the last floor of the tomb is a great magic circle embodying the Tree of Life, the treasure of the elves. It is a facility that exists to purify the dreadful curse put on the Black Dragon's heart. She has extended her life by a thousand years using the magic circle's power, and finally succeeded in purifying the dragon heart. But in exchange she was eroded by the curse and lost her humanity. Now, Zephyr and his companion pulled her out of the darkness, yet she doesn't know how she can repay them. So she asks, for what purpose does Zephyr want with the dragon heart? Instead of explaining because of they don't have enough time, he asks her to read his memories. She saw all of it, his lonely journey to fight the demon god, how the angel asks him to entertain the gods, all of his cherished comrades that he made along the way, and his process going ten years back to today. Meanwhile, a traces of flashes in the path of the battle between the Saint Lucius and his supposedly best friend Matthias. The demon thoughts how amazing he feels to have an omnipotence power like becoming a god, barraging Lucius who wears his overpriced equipment, when suddenly appears a magic circle on the demon god worshippers that sneaks becoming a priest. The centipedes bursting open from their chest as they ran toward Matthias. He uses a skill called seizure to absorb the power that's stored in the branded worm from nearby demon god worshippers. Now, not only Lucius doesn't able to deal massive amount of damage to him, Matthias yet to get stronger. After that he uses a skill that burns everything. Seeing that, Lucius knew that the skill is dangerous, so he tells his men to maximize their defensive skills. The fire is so strong that no one except one that defended by the overpriced shield are incinerated. Seeing how his party members get burned, Lucius asks him to not commit any more evil. That instead, enraged Matthias, as how dare Lucius, of all people say that. Even though he is not a saint candidate, Lucius received the stigmata, and the original saint candidate, Matthias gets left out. The people is disappointed, after they invested so much into his family, thinking that he is a fraud and all. Matthias is furious that Lucius' family sells out the name of Saint, saying that the people only can overcome chaos if they receive Lucius's blessing, then extorted the assets of the devotees. He screams his lung out, saying that the Temple of Light is the true evil. Meanwhile, Eurydica calls out to Zephyr as the pitiful one. She cries as she saw the future that he walks. So he tells her that this time, he wants to win against the demon god, as if someone the likes of Eurydica helps him to help transplant the dragon heart into him. She apologizes as she cannot abide by that favor. She tells him that a thousand years ago, the world was on the verge of collapse. The strongest of the seven dragons, the black dragon Kaiseris, set the entire world aflame. Although Kaiseris was one of the twelve heroes that led the war against the demons, he lost his reason and went berserk due to the demon curse. The Archmage, Princess Eurydica, along with other strong individuals such as the Knight Georgius, and the gold dragon who stood on the side of humanity. The remaining eleven heroes had no choice but to face their old comrade Kaiseris to protect the world. After fighting desperately, the battle with the Black Dragon that went on for an entire year come to a close with a strike from the Knight Georgius. Zephyr reveals how the demon god, Tartarus able to descend to the human world through summoning, and that's the entire reason for the demon god worshipper. Her goals in the past and his current goal are the same. Eurydica thoughts how they are so different, she wonders why Zephyr reminds her of Georgius. He says how proud he is, after Eurydica and the gold dragon spent three years purifying the dragon heart, and after so many mock transplant, he is finally ready to be the first dragon slayer, and will have the power to protect the world. Instead, the transplant failed, and the curse ate Georgius alive. It turns out that the gold dragon betray them making it as it seems the curse has been lifted from the dragon heart. At this point, it is unknown what his motive are, but he claims that he had fun being on the humanity's side, however he also has a duty that he must fulfill. Using a skill called Dragon Tongue, he commands Eurydica to keep her mouth shut for eternity, about the secret of the world that she learned about something else that's being censored. 
he says how unfortunate that they were too greedy for the dragon heart, adding that they could have spent their old days happily with their daughter if not for it. He also says that Eurydica's skill is quite marvelous, as the dragon heart was perfectly transplanted within Georgius's body, along with the demon curse hidden within. She fights him, she ripped out the dragon heart from his chest with her own hands, and then for a thousand years, after purifying the curse, she was waiting for a suitable hero to pass on the dragon heart. She is already aware that Zephyr is worthy of it, however, his body is not ready to receive the dragon heart. If she transplanted into him now, his body will either be shattered into pieces or he will be crippled. He knows that, and intending to use the strong luck, which she also knew. She says that there is another moment for Zephyr to use strong luck in, as she tries to say it when Zephyr asks her. She got silenced by the power of the gold dragon who cursed her thousands years ago. She is enraged with it, as it already be thousands years yet he is still restricting her with dragon tongue. But she refused to back down and indirectly saying it. It will be when Zephyr must choose between the one he treasure most and someone else. However, she offers Zephyr after considering future risk, and after he has the transplant of the dragon heart now, he needs to hunt the other four dragons within a year. Well, with everything he knows now, a year is way too long to kill four dragons. He promised Eurydica that he will show her the safe world that she and Georgius wanted to see. He will accomplish it in half a year, so she can lay down her duty and watch over him in the afterlife. She cries as she apologizes. She decides to pass on the duty that she could not complete in her era over to Zephyr. She opens up her tomb to take up the dragon heart. Now she finally convinced to transplant the heart to Zephyr. As she takes up the dragon heart, she pays her respect to Zephyr's resolve, the new hero. So then she begin the process of the transplant. A few moments later, he finds himself in a dark place where he can't see anything. As he uses his mana to feel the surrounding, he knew that he felt something similar to that before, something other than himself is in there. Suddenly a massive eye appears behind Zephyr, as Zephyr turns around the thing attacks him immediately. He was Kaiserus, and he grabs Zephyr enraged with the fact that Zephyr dares to covet his power. That is the evil desire of Kaiserus left within his dragon heart. He smells Zephyr up, and he can smell the gods on him. It turns out that he hates the gods to the bone, saying that Zephyr is the last person he would ever hand over his power to and he just eats Zephyr up, shredding him to pieces. Meanwhile, Matthias massacres the Temple Knights. The Light Temple has nothing they possess that able to stand up against him. At last, the last two members that survived aside from Lucius are in Matthias' hands. Now, all that's left is Lucius, with the fire magic Matthias bombards him. Fortunately that same attack is no use against the overpriced shield he possesses. A moment later, he uses his light magic to counter, but it is still too slow as Matthias already dashed behind him. In an instant, he clawed Lucius's back twice, and Matthias knows that his reaction speed is noticeably slower, signify that he is extremely fatigued. The more time passes the more acclimated Matthias is with the demonic power. Moreover, his recovery speed is ridiculous while Lucius keeps accumulating damage when they are exchanging blows. As Lucius swings his spear, Matthias grabs it, and from point-blank range, he summons his fire magic again that blasts Lucius, smashing him into the wall. Right now, both Arno and Leona who have been giving him support are dead. He has no choice but to use his saint power. However, he knows that he might end it up in a bigger trouble if he uses that power. On the other hand, Matthias wants to end their fight, when suddenly the fireball he summoned disappears. It surprised him that a feather coated with a light power penetrated his fireball and annihilated it. In the end, Lucius uses his saint power to summon his future self, as he asks Lucius with how much of Lucius's lifespan will he offer for summoning that power. Lucius offers one month of his life, but the power seems to want half a year worth of his life to defeat the demonification Matthias. So he accepts it. Lucius get powered up with all of the light he will ever need to defeat a mere demonification. At that moment, Matthias, the demon feels afraid of the power Lucius possesses, as he is supposedly is no match for Matthias, yet, with a flick of Lucius's hand, he split open Matthias' chest. In the end, Lucius barrages him with the light's beam, decimating the demonification Matthias. Looking at his dying supposedly best friend, Lucius explained that it's a saint-exclusive skill called Glimpse of Glory. He borrows power from the angel that he become in the future in exchange for his lifespan. It's a closely guarded secret of the temple that only the power and portion of cardinals know. That is why average lifespan of a saint is around 30 years, because the temple always force the saint into dangerous places for its own benefit. The position of saint is a brutal one, as they are nothing but jesters being played around by the temple. He then asks Matthias whether something like that, what he greeted over to the point that he betrayed his friend and abandoned everything. 
Mathias laugh, saying that Lucius was not the only jester in that matter. He adds that the only difference between them is that the goddess of light acknowledged Lucius, but not Mathias. In the end, Mathias dissipated into dust, as his hatred towards the goddess remains in his heart. The next thing Lucius does is to heal his dying priests. He is bumped with the fact that from all of the temple's party member, only the three of them is alive. He says that the raid is over and orders them to go back. Meanwhile, the effect of the strong luck helps Zephyr to fend of the dragon's attack. He expresses that there is no need for her to intervene just because he spaced out for a bit. He knows that he is inside of his own consciousness, it is not reality. What most important in there is his spirit, all he needs to do is to recall who he was. His future self from his last life, the armor and power he possesses are coming back to him, and in an instant he jumps off towards the dragon. Punching Kaiserus's eyes, as he summons his sword, he expresses how that is not the first time he has to fight the evil desire of a dragon. Including the one in his previous life, Kaiserus's evil's desire is the fifth that he has to conquer. He expresses how annoying the dragons are, telling the Kaiserus if he is dead, he should just let himself be absorbed. Adding that as the dragons go out of their way to test people to see if they are worthy of the dragon powers. With full confidence he tells the dragon that he will beat the shit out of him, and do as Zephyr says. Kaiserus says that the only top-notch thing about Zephyr is his mouth, asking him to come. With full power, Zephyr faced the supposedly strongest dragon in the world. Meanwhile, Ned awakes as he is confused with what in the world is going on right now in front of his face. He sees Eurydica is busy with doing something to Zephyr, and he seems to be unconscious. He thinks that might be his chance to attack the boss, but as he tries to stand up, his body doesn't want to move because he experiences mana freezing. Eurydica tells him that he shouldn't get up yet, and suggesting him to get some rest. Before that, she also cast a magic on him that makes him throws up. It was the branded worm that he swallowed, and Eurydica commends him, knowing that the worm is in its larval state. Signify that Ned has never used the branded worm's power, and he managed to obtain that level of strength purely through hard work. As he's starting to lose conscious again, she tells him that he will recover after a long nap. Three days later, somewhere else in the dungeon, Lucius, Arno and Leona is lost because the dungeon's layout had changed. Arno wants to leave the place immediately but Lucius has another plan. He wants to look for the stake of faith, as he thinks that's the only way they can escape in time, knowing that the two slave, Zephyr and Ned were acting strange in the raid. Lucius assumes that they are different factions from the demon god cult, and they might be after the clearing rites to the dungeon. Now, he must find them and asks for the escape method. As they move toward the boss room, the guard knight welcomes them with his attacks. Lucius still manages to hold his ground, as the other two is wondering how can the stake of faith is inside the boss room while the gatekeeper is alive. Lucius is having a hard time dealing with the gatekeeper. He can only use glimpse of glory once a week, and he used it already against Matthias. He thoughts that it's finally his ends, as he feels afraid for not being able to see his family again. But, suddenly Zephyr opens up the gate, he witnesses how Lucius pinned down by the massive gatekeeper. Zephyr expresses how perfect the timing is, and because he was being asked for a favor earlier, now he needs to help the saint. So he uses the dragon tongue magic, telling the gatekeeper to bow down. That in turn, smashing the gatekeeper's head into the ground, and surprise Lucius with what just happened in front of him. He is so surprised that the gatekeeper, the monster that he can't fight on his own is obeying the person that he know of as a slave. Now, Zephyr is counting down on how effective his dragon power is, and at the tenth second, the gatekeeper breaks free. He evades its attack as he knows that in order to prevent the dragon heart from going berserk due to imbalance between his power and the dragon's power, the dragon heart's capacity is restricted to 1%. Of course, even if there are restrictions, that is still the power of dragon. Though the gatekeeper pick up the sword, it's called Graham. It's a weapon made for the purpose of killing the strongest dragon. So it's a bad matchup for Zephyr, but he has his another power as well. The Sword of Light, given by the Goddess of Light, she lifted the restrictions on using the Divine Weapon with the request to save her saint, Lucius. With that, he summons the Divine Sword's power to kill the Gatekeeper, as he's saying thank you to the formerly Dragon Slayer, Georgius for his hard work keeping the peace. Lucius knows that what Zephyr has is the Divine Artifact of Legends, that only a few chosen priests known of, the Sword of Light. Now he also knows that he was wrong, and Zephyr is not the demon god worshipper, rather he feels the goddess of light's presence from Zephyr. Not only that, Lucius also feels something similar to when he met the gold dragon, an undefiable pressure. As Zephyr turns around, Lucius and the temple's priests kneeling in front of him, greeting him as the exalted one. 
it is explained that the battle between Zephyr and Kaiserus within his consciousness lasted three days. In the end, Kaiserus acknowledges his power, but that doesn't mean Kaiserus trusts him, so Kaiserus will continue to watch Zephyr from within. When he opened his eyes, Zephyr finds that Ned is unconscious and Eurydica had crumbled into ash. She also left a keepsakes for Zephyr, a crystal of magic, that he will have to give to Eurydica's descendant and master key. That will allow Zephyr to move around easily in the tomb. Lucius then removes the slave brand on Zephyr and Ned. With that, Zephyr also asks Lucius to take care of the debts as well, and of course Lucius is more than willing to do so. Now he also offers to help Zephyr more as currently. He thoughts that Zephyr is on their side. While Ned is thinking that it won't be too bad to be able to join arms with the saint, as he knows himself that Saint Lucius is the ultimate weapon raised by the temple through the money they plunder from people like Ned. Lucius is simply someone that Ned cannot bring himself to have good feelings for. For now, he thinks that he will use anything he can, as well as Zephyr. Then, Lucius thinks that it's not a good place to talk, and offer them to go back first, but Zephyr reveals that their dogfight only just begin. He informs that the third parish of the Temple of Light must already have become a nest of demon god worshippers by now. Due to the forces that the demon god worshipper Cardinal Aldean brought, and the twin knights, two of the strongest in the continent. Even with Zephyr who obtained the Dragon Heart, his strength is still constrained, so they need an ample preparation. Especially against Aldean, the situation won't simply resolve with just a battle. Zephyr then takes out the Master Key. He changes the layout of the dungeon to reveals the treasure room. He offers them to gear up first, as Eurydica's treasure room that no one has able to enter for a thousand years. Inside, there are so many treasure that able to fill up a country, even high-grade treasures that protected inside a crystal barrier. Even though they don't know how to take out the treasure, Zephyr simply takes them out with the master key. Zephyr also finds an elixir that able to help them to identify the demon god worshippers. That makes him happy as things are starting to work out in his favor. Not only that, the party of five also get geared up as well, with them taking equipment that suits themselves best. While Ned, one supposedly Zephyr's teacher, taking a crow cape, dusk tunic, this bracelet, and sword of mirage. While Zephyr takes Graham for himself, and dragon said armor that makes him also fully geared up. Now, they discuss the plan to take Aldian, where the tricky things to deal with is that Aldian is a high-ranked noble and all Lucius knows is that they don't have a way to identify the demon god worshippers. That's when Zephyr reveals the vial to the party as long as Lucius able to identify them. As the saint, the son of the goddess of the light, people will listen to him. Meanwhile, Alponso gets controlled by Aldia, and it's true that he is already succeeding in taking over the parish temple. Lucius's wife, Claudia and their kid can only watch as she only knows that Aldian is a priest and wonders why would he do something like that. Aldian asks whether she thinks that he had showed her something amusing. Not only that, he also explains that his branded worm is different from the others. As he takes it out, his branded worm has a special ability called Hive, which already evolved into a queen, and able to gives birth to larva, that allows him to brainwash and control any human who ingests it, just like the reverend in front of him. And with that, he asks her to persuade Lucius, yet as she asks him what she needs to persuade Lucius for, that makes her kid cry. His name is Marius, and Aldian intends to use his hive to him, saying that it's little bug friend as a present for him. But Claudia fend his hand off, throwing the bugs away from the kid. That also reveals the other bugs that make off Aldian's body. As he gets enraged with her, a knight arrives reporting that there's a trouble in the temple, adding that Lucius is outside. Aldian is surprised to learn that Lucius is back that soon, so he looks outside. What he witnesses is a lot of his knights get knocked out flat by the trio, Lucius, Arno and Leona. He greets him, as it's been a while after they meet, and Aldian is shouting why would a saint attack the priests of his own parish. Right now, Lucius is already using the potion of scrutiny, and when he add a drop of that on his eyes, he will be able to see the branded worms within the demon god worshipper's body. Witnessing how powerful Aldian Worm is, the Saint of Light, Lucius proclaims to arrest Aldian for acts of heresy, adding that the sins of deceiving the Temple of Light is a heavy weight to bear, and telling Aldian that now he will pay for it. That enrages him, laughing and calling the saint as impertinent brat. Alponso appears, as of now, he is controlled by Aldian, asking whether Lucius has evidence to accuse the Cardinal of heresy which of course Lucius notices that in his uncle's body is not a branded worm, but Aldian's ability that Zephyr spoke of. But Zephyr prohibit to reveals the potions of scrutiny, as it will stir a lot of trouble that might get Lucius killed, and he suggests to get surefire evidence. Eurydka tombs is a great labyrinth that covers an extremely wide underground area. 
that range actually extends as far as directly underneath the third parish temple. And if they move to the right location and dig through the ground to get outside, they will be arrive at the base that Matthias used, where the demon god worshippers held their assemblies. That's when they found the evidence in the abandoned mansion, and that's what Lucius bring to arrest Aldian. That's are the letters that Aldin exchanged with Matthias, his plot to seize the dragon heart, and his acts of worship to the demon god, all are recorded in those letter. Though there are instruction to burn immediately after reading, it seems that Matthias hold on to them in the case that he would get betrayed. In the end, Aldian laughs knowing that Lucius that thorough with investigating him, or whether Matthias feels some short of fidelity toward Lucius and blurt out everything. He then reveals it, as the executive of the demon cult, rank 11 of the demon god worshippers, Aldian. But for now, Lucius still unable to do anything as he also has Claudia, and their kid hostage. And he asks Lucius whether he would ingest the special worm Aldian has, with powerful brainwashed ability, or Claudia should. Without hesitation Lucius offers to eat it and tells him not to lay a hand on her and his kid. But in the end, Aldian decides to feed it to Claudia anyway, where suddenly Ned appears, stabs him from behind. It turns out that the mist bracelet able to hide his presence, that makes the twin knight fails to detect him. In turn, his sword of mirage able to hurt Aldian, his first priority is to save the kid and Claudia, so Ned grabs her intending to take her away. But the gold knight stood in his way, as of at that moment is his first time facing the older of the twin knights, and he is incredible, because he possesses the power of one of the continent's ten strongest. To cover for Ned, Lucius uses his spear to distract Aldian and his knights, that leaving the gold knight no choice but to defend his lord. That makes an opening for Ned to take on the silver knight, and for Claudia to snatch back her kid. Now Aldian is confused whether the Eastern One deceived him, to ruin his plan and him into a corner by pretending to cooperate. And all he thinks now is to get away, as he lost his hostage and if Lucius uses his glimpse of glory, he can easily kill Aldian. The Gold Knight gets down from the tower, preparing to face the Saint as the Silver Knight is helping Aldian to run away. It is then revealed that he is Castor, rank 20 of the Demon God Worshipper, will go face to face with Lucius, the first Son of Light. From all over the town, the people is prohibited from entering, because the knights is in the middle of training. Even the mining slave are able to see the smokes that comes out from the temple from afar. Arno and Leona goes against the lower rank knights and priests that swarming into their way. But with their newly attained equipment, they are able to hold their ground quite well. While the saint and the gold knights wreaking havoc in the temple, breaking buildings one after another. Therefore, Lucius is the one that has the upper hand. Castor thoughts on how annoying it is that he has to deal with Lucius' spear. Because in a face-off between a sword and a lance, a lance is fundamentally more advantageous since it can be used to attack with long range. But it's different with him as he is the tenth strongest knight in the continent. He evades the lance's tip and goes to cut the saint up. Castor doesn't expect it that Lucius wears a mirror chainmail, which reflects 50% of the damage he received. Lucius counter-attacks him as he expresses that he, the saint let the twin knight to rose on the rank within the continent, while he barrages Castor with trusses from his extremely overpriced spear. Because a divine being such as himself, cannot dare to be placed in the rankings of mere humans, as he pushes the gold knight into a corner. In the end, Lucius uses a light magic called Judgment, making a massive hole on Castor's stomach. As the saint lands down, Leona cheers up, calling out to him, thinking that he manages to beat the gold knight. But, he yells to them not to come closer, as his stomach also get hurt, because as he uses his judgment, he received total 7 attacks. Castor heals up, with the worm's ability, saying that he also has reflection ability that reflected around 50-60% to 60 of the damage from judgment. He claims that he was planning to hold Lucius off until Aldian manages to escape. But now he is enraged and decides to kill Lucius. He dashes toward the saint, instantly appears behind Lucius. Now, the saint fails to react to the attack and Castor also uses his maximum power with the help of the worm in his body, shouting that he will send Lucius to his goddess right away. But suddenly, Aldian sent message to Castor, asking him to come to Aldian right away. As he got distracted with the message, Lucius uses chain fail and paralyze, that make him unable to evade anymore. Lucius then uses another judgment to him, seemingly that the saint doesn't care about the reflected damage he might receives after. Somewhere else, it turns out that Zephyr intercepts Aldian escape route while all of chaos that happened in the parish temple. Zephyr tells him to get up, as his beating is not over yet. And that's when Lucius reveals to the gold knight that his job was to keep Castor occupied from the start to kill the three of Aldian. 
the silver and the gold knights one by one after separating them. Lucius mock him, saying that he sure fell into their trap quite marvelously. That makes the gold knight so enraged to him. That looks like his vein is going to burst open. Back at the demon god worshipper castle, Aldean asks to transport the dragon heart with his ability. He can control the third parish temple and possess the saint. So, the leader allows him to, yet, Aldean can only wondering why it turns out this way. He already planned for every situation, but he fails to count for the Easter One's betrayal. He previously said that he will eliminate his disciple, but in the end, Aldean was left running away from the temple. Then, both Aldean and the Silver Knight arrive at their getaway carriage, as what concerns Aldean the most is his scale of his enemies. If the Eastern One betrayed him, then he doesn't know how many more Dragon King-style disciple are in hiding. As he goes into the carriage, he touches a green and sticky substance. In an instant, pain spread throughout his body as he screams his lungs out. He knows it was poison, one that hurt like hell. It turns out that Zephyr disguised himself as the temple's priest. Aldean tries to ask who the hell he is, but Zephyr kicked the high novel priest in the face, telling him to shut up. The Silver Knight is quite slow-witted, telling Zephyr to surrender. So, Zephyr throws a poison needle into the Silver Knight's face, saying how shabby the knight are, adding that Aldean should bring around the real Silver Knight with him instead of a fake who dies from a single poison needle. So Aldean tries to calls him out, Pelux, the real Silver Knight. But, Zephyr already beheaded the Silver Knight that stays on guard. As 12 hours ago, the trio, Zephyr, Ned and Lucius gang up on the Silver Knight. Where Lucius feels skeptical at first, but it turns out that the potion of scrutiny can really distinguish demon god worshippers. The original plan is that Ned will hand over the dragon heart that he stole, which his master explains. There will be a temple priest among them, telling Ned to lay low after getting the slave's brand removed. But, the priests and his master plans to use the slave brand to restrain Ned and plan to kill him. Now Ned knows, while Zephyr knows it from his past life, where he also knows that Lucius who was controlled by the worm, was a nightmarish enemy. However many times he recall it, what he remembers is the horror when Lucius's wife begs Zephyr to kill her. With all of the dragon heart's power he can muster, he summons a lightning that envelope his sword, striking into Aldean. But, he realizes that there's not enough volume for a person to disintegrate. Suddenly, there's an attack coming to Zephyr's way as he block it with his sword. The attack comes from Aldean who releases his demonification form, as he claims that even though he is stronger than the Twin Knights, he choose not to fight because he doesn't want to show that form to anyone. Zephyr knows that Aldean segregated a part of himself as the lightning fell and returned to his true form. In that state, the poison must have already been removed. It turns out that Aldean originally demonificated already, and gained the mimicry skill that allows him to mimic human appearance. With that, he gathers all of his strength into his hand, and he stomps the ground with it. The impact destroy the forest hundreds of yards away. Though, Ned and Claudia notices that the battle between Zephyr and Aldean already begun. So Ned tells her to hide with her kid while he goes to back Zephyr up. He tells her to not come out until he says so, while giving her the bracelets that able to hide their presence. Then he goes, leaving both of them in the cave. As Ned went towards the battle, he thoughts how he has waited for that day, the day to take his revenge against the beasts, who killed his father and took their family heirloom. One is already dead, only two remains, and Ned is determined to send them all to hell. Meanwhile, at the temple, the Gold Knight is using his branded worm's power. His attack power has gotten significantly higher, but the sharpness of his attack has reduced. The amount of effective blows he's landing on the saint is decreasing. Lucius calls out to Arno, as he immediately uses the highest grade support skill there is, called the Light on the Battlefield. Not only that, even the spirit can also receive the buffs. Shooting start then goes to the gold knight, as Leona's chain of light follow suits behind the spirit. Though, that kind of slow attacks are not effective against the gold knight, but, once shooting stars magic debuff him, slowing him after a direct contact. The next person that comes is Lucius, with his overpriced spear he thrusts toward the gold knight with no mercy. Even the knight tries to counter it. The attack fails to find its target and misses Lucius. Though the strikes went to the building and it was the gold knight plan all along. He wasn't aiming for Lucius but the building, so the rumble will goes to the brainwashed priests below and Lucius's uncle. Then, the gold knight manages to run away from the temple. At this point, the saint already destroy a third of the worms in the knight's body as he runs towards where his master calling him. He is so loyal to Aldean because his lord gave both the twin knights new meaning to their life. But, as he dashing around in the tree, a mana strike appeared from below, striking the gold knight in half. 
It was Ned, with the Mirage Sword, which allows him to hurt the demonification worm inside the Gold Knight's body. Laying down on the ground, Caster is pissed with the fact that Ned keeps getting in his way. That's when Ned reminds the Gold Knight that he is the one who killed Ned's father. In turns, Caster mock him, saying how can he remembers the names of hundreds of people he killed. As he finishes recovering with the power of the worm, he took off his armor, saying that he will let Ned lives if he stay away from the Knight's way now. As he counts to ten, he thinks that the temple's party must not be confident enough to defeat him head-on. That's when Ned reveals that he has the other twin's sword, the moon sword that the Silver Knights wields. As Ned says that what Caster's brother last words to his face. That of course pissing him off so much, and Ned's plan to hold off the Gold Knight is working. Meanwhile, the strike that destroy the forest doesn't really hurt Zephyr. They trade blows one after another. With the Dragon Slayer armor set, Zephyr is able to defend against the powerful punch from the demonification Aldian. In return, with Gram in hand, the Dragon Slayer sword, Zephyr counters the attacks with his Dragon King-style swordsmanship. Though, Aldian is able to concentrate the mana, not only to change forms, he can even recreate the sharpness of metal and monsters' hard thick hide. He also able to mimic insects' digestive fluid, lava-like substance and spreading it around him, aiming it towards Zephyr, after evading it. With the Cloud Dragon Ascension Zephyr slashes Aldian into pieces, a sword technique that focused on speed and accuracy. That doesn't stop Aldian's attack, as one of the tentacles spews more digestive fluid, but Zephyr is able to tank it with the set armor. Next, Aldian's body pieces turn into various weapons that surround Zephyr immediately, and in that instant, he sent barrages of attacks towards the Dragon Slayer. His other name is Immortal Aldian and he claims that no matter how much a mere human cuts him, he will keep regenerating. As he finishes, he grips his hand, focusing the mana he has into his hand saying that he will only half kill Zephyr, and will put an insect in him that will make him Aldian's subordinate instead of the saint. And he punches Zephyr, blasting him away towards a boulder and disintegrate it. Aldian doesn't stop there though, he jumps up in the air with the mana gathered in both of his hand. He turns it into a double sword and strike them towards Zephyr. Right after that, he combined both of the sword into one. Making it a bigger sword, Aldian also coat it with the mana he possesses and with the help from the branded worm. Then he strikes it, making a massive explosion in the area, with it, also appear a blinding light in the collision. But he doesn't know that Zephyr is a dragon slayer, even with 1% output of his dragon heart. He manages to stop the sword strike with only his fingers. There where he reveals it, that Aldian and his twin knights are too easy for Zephyr to deal with, but he wants to reward Ned giving him the chance to satisfy his revenge. And secondly, at this moment demons are rare, so Zephyr wants to test his dragon heart, as he release it, the 1% output of the power from the dragon heart. And his eyes turn red and dragon scales appeared on his skin. Zephyr then says that the data he might gain from battling demons is especially valuable, and immortal like Aldian is perfect to be the punching bag. He is going to test a few things, as he asks Aldian to endure it as best as he can while Zephyr giving off such an intense pressure that makes Aldian shivers. In the end, he flies trying to run away, thinking that he doesn't want to die, not in a place like that. But with the dragon power, Zephyr claws Aldian mid-flight bringing him down. As the demons fells, Zephyr tells him to get up, adding that he still have more to test out, and he won't let the demon die easily. Somewhere else, Caster is able to pin Ned down in their battle. In the end, Ned is about to lose against the Gold Knight of Aldians. Though, before the battle Zephyr explained on how to defeat the Gold Knights to Ned. Originally, 25 years ago both of the Gold and Silver Knights are a noble with promising futures. But, Aldian who took notice of them, interfered with the Vigo Count family's succession and made the Twin Knights his subordinates. And to them, he bestowed the Sun Sword and Moon Sword that resonate with each other to maximize their unique constitutions. The Twin Knights' notorious skills, perfected through the Sun Sword and Moon Sword. Once he attacks there inevitably forms a gap in his movements, before he moves on to his next stance, it's a weakness that everyone has. But, the Silver Knight's attacks as if making up for the Gold Knight's gap. These technique called Eclipse, they transcend their own limits of accuracy, and speed to unleash a storm of blades that slaughters the enemy without a single gap. That's where Ned comes, to recreate Eclipse by resonating with the Gold Knight through the Moon Sword and use it against the Gold Knight. That surprised Caster, as he never told anyone but Aldian about the secret of the Eclipse, but how does Ned knows about it? While at the same time, Aldian's screams were once again echoing in Caster's head, but he did not listen. And just as planned, after Ned shows him the Silver Knight sword and technique, Caster won't be able to ignore Ned, no matter how worried he is about Aldian. So that is precisely why Ned has to kill Caster now, because there won't be any other chances than that.
They trade blows again, Ned with his vengeance and the same thing could be said with Castor. A few moments later, Castor split Ned in half, only to realize that it's a trick by the power of Ned's cape. That instant, Ned appears behind Castor with his Dragon King style ready on his left palm to immobilize him. Now Ned manages to stop Castor's movement, and his chances arrive. He strikes the Moon Sword toward Castor, but the Sun Sword moves on its own even though Castor has been stunned. That what's Ned doesn't know, the two sword are drowned toward each other, and with that Castor able to finally land an attack to Ned with his hand. And that is how, he is able to pin Ned down on the ground, wishing with every fiber of his being to kill Ned. Though, Ned punches the sun sword and starts performing his Dragon King style to the fullest. He burned Castor's eyes with the electric energy, on top of that, Ned also blends his presence with the power of the crow cape, making Castor has a hard time dealing with him now. And with Moon Sword, Ned summons a massive lightning, and strikes it towards the Gold Knight. And at this point, one of the spots in the continent's strongest ten that the Twin Knights, the Vigo brothers held, had become vacant, while Ned finally able to satisfy his anger towards the people that took his life before.